All right, so we'll call the select board meeting for Wednesday, April 28th, 2021 to order. And the usual reminders, uh, all votes will be taken via roll call. And uh, this meeting is being recorded. Actually, Jennifer, can you start that recording? Perfect, all right, so this meeting is being recorded and broadcast on Hadley Media as well. And in attendance is John Weskevitz, myself, David Phil, Amy Parsons, uh, Jane Nevin-Smith, and Joyce Chunglo from the select board. So first order of business is the consent agenda. We have warrants AP2143, AP2143S, AP2144, AP2144S, we have Park and Recreation Mother's Day Wagon Ride, May 9th at 2 p.m. Uh, recycling Coordinator Appointment, Kathy Nelson. Uh, I think it's, let me see, United Public Service Employees Union. I think that's the right definition there. Uh, Public Works Memorandum of Understanding Agreement Approval. Police Department MOU Agreement Approval. Fiber Optic uh, Invitation for Bid bid award to ComTrack. Could I get a motion to approve? I move. I move to approve. Okay. Nope. So was that Amy? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. But I wanted, I wanted discussion. On which one? Uh, if the wagon ride and things was set up and cleared with um, fire and uh, police. All right, so we'll pull out the uh, park and rec and anything else or just that one? Just that one, I might prove it. I just wanted more details to make sure it's covered. And can I get a second for that a consent agenda? Second. second. All right, so motion by Amy, second by Jane. And uh, all those in favor, uh, Jennifer? Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalu? Yes. Muscovitz? Uh, yes, except for uh, police and DPW contracts. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right, and Joyce, go ahead with the uh, park and rec. Um, just, just wanted to know if it was cleared and everything is okay with um, police and fire on that that they're that it's covered with them using cemetery road um for traffic and things of that nature because i don't care what time of the day it is or whatever that road seems to continually be busy so i just wanted to uh be sure that everything was okay with um all safety so joyce um i don't know if anybody from park and rec is on here i'm clicking through and i don't see anybody but uh, we were in the process of doing that um, and they uh, responded back to one of my emails that they were either not not sure that they were going to do the uh, event now or putting it on. Hold. So um, I don't know if uh, if you should take bother taking a vote on it tonight until we get more information. But uh, they were working with us on it. So if it does go forward, I assume they'll put it back in front of you. Um, but my last communication with them was that it was probably going to be canceled or postponed. Okay. Okay. So do we want to just pass over that or? Do we want to put it on May 8th or 9th? Isn't that far away? Um, contingent. Yes. If there is okay between police and fire and uh, chief Mason, you can let us know if uh, uh, you have had contact from them to move yeah. forward with this. Would that be fine? Yeah. yeah um, I, I think, uh, you know, there's some other folks who have heard something similar. Uh, about that. But yeah, you can certainly vote it contingent upon that. And uh, we'll keep you posted as to whether or not they're going to have it. But I, I don't think it's going to, it's going to happen at this point. So um, I, I would say you're, you're fine voting it like that. Okay. Cause I know they had put it on to do something in the winter and then that never uh, materialized. So, um, you know, if this can happen now, that's fine, but only if they have it cleared with you. All right. Is that a motion guys? Yes. All right. I'll that? second it. All right. Motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Anything else on Park and Rec? All right. Jennifer? Roll we'll call vote Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Miskevitz? Yes. 
Parsons. Yes. Thank you. All right, so uh, we'll do public comments next, uh, limited to 15 minutes. Uh, please limit your comments to three minutes, minutes each so that way other people may speak. Is anybody here for public comments? Wave at your camera or let us know that you're here. All right, last chance. Okay, we'll keep moving. Uh, since we have the finance committee here, uh, let's go ahead and jump down to the finance committee unless I'm missing anybody else's appointments. I don't think so. Uh, David, I think the levy people were here early so that we could get them out of the way. All right, well then we'll do that then. Sorry, finance committee. I'm sorry, finance committee too. <laughs> um, uh, Carolyn, do you want to uh, introduce this topic? Sure, sure. Um, I want to introduce a couple representatives from Woodard and Curran. They've been helping the town uh, staff review the needs and next steps for the Hadley flood protection system over the past year. Woodard and Curran, I wanted to just give you some of their credentials that they're a national engineering and consulting firm, as well as a utility contract operations community co company. Scott Medeiros is a senior client manager in their Enfield, Connecticut office. And Rich Niles is a project manager in their Andover Mass office. And Rich has been working with the town since 2014 as part of a phased approach to evaluate the conditions of the dike. Um, and they've been really patient with me as I'm learning to understand um, all of those issues. And I thought it would be really helpful because there's uh, something that I think w is important that would be should be placed on the uh, is presently on the warrant and on the draft warrant. And I thought it would be helpful to explain that um, to all of the select board members and anybody else who's watching. So um, Scott or Rich, I don't know who's going to talk first. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead, Carolyn. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for having us this evening. Nice to see everybody. Um, it's uh, interesting times with all these meetings. Um, I, th I think I should be able to share my screen. I'm going to do that real quick and, and just share the handout that was um, in the um, packet here. So if I can do that and you guys can see that, can you guys see that? Can everybody see this? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. I, well, I can see that. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the hand, the cursor moving on it? No. The white line down the screen. Yeah, I can't. Okay. I lost it, Rich. I had it for a minute and it's gone. Yeah, I have a white line. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Let me try to try to do this again here. Um. Can you guys see this now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. I can see it now. All right. Sorry about that. I, I have my s multiple screens set up here. And, um, <clears throat> so what I thought I would do is provide a little background and, and just to kind of refresh, um, I think back to was the last study that I completed with the town. Um, and we presented the results of that to the select board at that time. So I just want to refresh a little bit sort of the work that's been done in the past and then what we're recommending for future um, work related to assessments and, and potential rehabilitation of some of the portions of the levy. Um, and so I wanted to go, go through background real quick. This summarizes this in this two pager here. Um, <clears throat> but as, as everybody probably knows, um, the levy system, which consists of uh, a dike along the Connecticut River here, Can you guys see my cursor? Yes. Okay. And then it travels south along Dyke Road, <clears throat> and then intersects with the Rail Trail Berm, which is the uh, Norwalk Rail Trail. So we refer to it as the Rail Trail Berm. And so these, these features provide flood protection, uh, provides protection as currently mapped by FEMA against the 100 year flood event. So um, this was what was constructed back in 1928. So quite some time ago, um, there was a breach in the flood of 1936. There was, as recent as 2009, there was um, a crack that was detected and, and the levy failed during uh, repair of that crack. Um, so this really sort of prompted the town back at that time to, to start to look at the levy in terms of, you know, it does it have other risks? Is it, is it um, in, in a state of, of, of good repair? Um, does it provide a level of protection? And the other driver 
was FEMA is in the process of, uh, or, or they're going to at some point soon be remapping the floodplain, uh, uh, updating the floodplain maps for Hampton County. So when they do that, they're going to look at this system and say, well, this is what's being what's providing protection. So this blue area is a hundred year floodplain as mapped by FEMA now. So this is the protected area within the floodplain <clears throat> that is being protected by the levee. When they remap this, they're going to look at it and say, well, does this levy system meet design criteria that we've established. So we started that process back in 2014 to look at um, whether or not the, the system meets FEMA criteria so we could certify it and it would maintain protection in terms of how this is mapped. Now it, it provides protection currently, obviously it was built a long time ago. So we started evaluating this against current design standards. Um, so we did a stepwise process starting back in 2014, did another study in um, 2016 and then 2018. And so as we progressed through those studies, we identified um, additional deficiencies. And so <clears throat> when I say deficiencies, it's against design criteria that, um, that currently exist. And this is just a quick summary in your handout here, which shows some of those deficiencies. So some things are minor, they're maintenance related. You know, animal burrows, um, you know, there's a lot of agriculture next to the lake, next to the dike. So there's animals that like to, uh, that are attracted to it to, to create homes. There's uh, some vegetated growth that and encroachments, meaning there's things that are too close to the levee that, that um, maybe need to be moved away or maintained. Um, but they're, the bigger issues are related to what we call seepage instability. So seepage refers to when the, the water is at flood stage. It's up against the dike. Um, it can seep through and, and basically destabilize the soils and result in a failure or a breach mm -hmm. under certain conditions. Um, stability refers to whether the geometry, the shape of the levee is suitable to provide that protection and, and resist those forces during flood events. So we did a, a subsurface investigation drilled through the levee at about 20 plus locations and evaluated the soil conditions and we identified some deficiencies. Um, <clears throat> along the levee itself, mostly along the Connecticut Riverside, and then uh, along the rail trail berm itself. Now, the rail trail berm was a, is a former railroad bed, it's never designed to be a levee, but it is at the same elevation and acts to provide flood protection. Um, so when we look at how do you address these deficiencies, um, they're, they're fairly significant. They're costly to do that because it requires some level of reconstruction. And the biggest challenge we identified was the rail trail berm is owned by DCR. In order to meet design standards per FEMA requirements, you would essentially need to do some level of reconstruction of the berm and clear every tree along it uh, to remove those root systems from the embankments for stability issues. It would dramatically change the, the character of the rail trail berm. You can see you have um, we call these encroachments in the you know, levee world here. Um, and I think they're a nice feature along the rail trail, but, um, and, and you guys have a beautiful rail trail through, through town here. It's, it's a prominent feature. Um, this, this uh, to upgrade this to meet design standards would require completely changing the character of that. So we looked at this and said, well, what about an alternative to that? We know that there's some work that, that may need to be done to the levee embankment along the river. What if we, scrap the rail trail berm and look at an alternative protection system that is actually similar length as it would be to rehab this portion um, and provide additional flood protection for all these properties in the downtown area. So basically looking at an alternative, doing an alternative analysis to see, is this a more cost-effective approach? Is this a better investment for the community to maintain the current level of protection for flooding here and enhance protection for all these properties. So there's a matter of providing real flood protection, but there's also an impact economically, um, not just due to flood events, but from an insurance perspective. Properties with federally backed mortgages are required to obtain flood insurance if they're in the floodplain. So there could be a significant benefit. The problem is, is we don't have a conceptual cost yet to see what does it cost to, to fix this portion? What would it cost to fix this? And what's the benefit of doing this and cost so that the town can make a decision as to how they move forward with significant capital investment. So what we proposed was um, evaluating options to upgrade the existing system 
And there's some other sort of miscellaneous items like inspections for, for additional drainage issues that um, would relate to some of the work that Chris needs to do from, from a maintenance perspective. Um, engaging the public, looking at the feasibility of whether this alternative is even possible. You know, there's significant uh, permitting requirements and, and obviously some environmental impact. Um, providing a cost, you know, estimating cost to conceptualize what that would look like and then an economic analysis to see what the benefit would be to the community. And, and then also developing an operations and maintenance plan. And so, so we, we proposed a, a budget to support this of 150,000. Now this is scaled back a bit from a recent proposal that, um, that was uh, provided to um, funding agencies. So I wanted to just touch real quick on funding and then I'll open it to questions. Um, so, so we've been working with Carolyn and Chris on evaluating over the last year, uh, funding opportunities that could support the evaluation that I just spoke of, as well as potentially, you know, construction related capital needs in the future. And, and one of the challenges is this is not your standard project, like, a, um, you know, a, just a regular old DPW project, where it's a water or a water and sewer project, where there's a lot of well established funding programs. There are flood programs through FEMA, there's flood, pro flood um, mitigation programs through um, through uh, the state, uh, there's the dam and seawall program. The challenge with a lot of these programs is there's a lot of legwork that needs to be done up front. There's a, a match component to that. So you have to put some cash into it. It's difficult to do in-kind services because it's primarily engineering work. And um, the, so the programs have also been fairly restrictive. So we, one of the programs we were most hopeful for was the uh, Massachusetts Vulnerability Preparedness Program, which is funding projects uh, to help communities build resilience. So you have an MVP plan. This project was identified as one of the highest priorities. However, the way that program has sort of morphed over the last couple of years, it's become highly competitive and they're looking for projects that are not such hard infrastructure projects. So that's a little bit frustrating for a lot of communities, but it's basically, we had, we submitted a pre-application for this project with that program. We had a meeting with them and they basically said, it doesn't fit the program, it's not eligible. And we suggest you pursue alternate funding programs. And, and we consulted with our internal funding team. We consulted again with MVP. We looked at a variety of programs and felt that to make, to put the town in a better position for, for additional funding, there's some upfront legwork that needs to be done. A lot of agencies don't like the fun things that look like deferred maintenance. So they won't fund your maintenance program so even some of your basic things like doing additional inspections to evaluate the condition, operations and maintenance plan, they don't fund those things. They will fund capital projects based upon well thought out developed projects where you've looked at alternatives. It's difficult to get money for this phase of work for this type of project. And, and, and we, we scoured the programs that are available currently. Um, so what we've been suggesting with clients for a variety of projects is, is to try to, you know, invest a little bit in identifying and clarifying the project that you think is best to pursue, make a strong case to agencies for the next level of capital investment. So that's, I think, um, kind of the key points I wanted to hit upon and, and sort of the rationale for why we suggested to Chris and, and Carolyn to put this as a warrant article to try to get to the next step to put the town in a much better position for, for future funding. So that was a, a lot, I'm sure. Um, I'll be quiet and take, take questions, I guess. So if you scroll back up to the first page of your thing there, uh, yep. where it shows the 100 year floodplain in blue, I think it was. Yeah, yes. So uh, I'm assuming that's East Street where it kind of ends. Uh, uh, this is, um, this, this is Middle Street. Okay, Middle right there. All right, this is yeah. Middle and this is West Street. Okay, and then is the obviously the area between the rail trail berm and the dike is unshaded because of the dike itself that it's not in the floodplain right or protected area correct that's that's okay. that's protected yes All right so is there any area um I, I guess how much more would we actually be protecting by at, considering this additional levy are we just talking about the downtown area or is this have further ramifications. 
because yeah so so that's so that's it's an interesting thing that and so there's a no action alternative to every project right? right um if you don't improve this to meet design standards you're at risk of fema saying it doesn't meet our standards we're going to map it as in the floodplain and these properties if they're at an elevation where their first floor is in the floodplain so there's further work that could be clarified for whether there'd be impact um and they have a federally backed mortgage they have to get flood insurance Flood insurance is expensive um i think most people would prefer not to be flooded insurance is just a recovery plan um so it doesn't address the real risk of an, an impact associated with flooding but it's also protecting um what i would call a limited portion of the community as a whole there's a lot of ag land that's protected um but there's no structure within that. So we looked at this and said, there's about 113 structures, something bigger than a shed within the current area here. If we look at uh, a similar length of, you know, uh, dike and, and, and propose it along Bay Road, then you would be um, within this area that's mapped, the shade, there's another 196 structures. And we, we evaluated based upon assessor's data probably a couple of years ago, um, that that would be another 36 million. So you have gas stations, you have critical infrastructure, pump stations, municipal infrastructure. Um, this is a significant portion of your downtown area. You have um, schools and critical facilities. So this would provide you know, significant flood risk protection and potentially significant economic benefit for properties that have insurance now that are paying for insurance. So does, it, does that answer your question? Yeah, so basically we're, I guess, quadrupling almost what we're protecting currently if we were to go this direction. And again, this is an estimate, yeah. you know, the, the goal or the proposed next steps were to evaluate this further and do a more detailed economic impact analysis. But, you know, the consequence of not certifying this means that some properties may need to get insurance and some communities decide to do that because the level of investment is significant and if you're not going to get enough benefit out of it then it's it's hard to justify to the public and it's hard to finance so that that's really the goal of next steps is to look at <clears throat> what what are our options considering cost what do i get out of it what's the benefit how could we fund it and so there's different ways to to slice it um but we don't have enough data in order to to make a, a a recommendation that's in the best interest of the community. Does the proposed levy go behind the houses on the south side of Bay Road? Uh, <clears throat> this is a cartoon cartoon drawing, so it, it's intentionally vague. <laughs> but to answer your question, um, um, you know, this is why this next phase involved public engagement to to start to look at you know what is this going to look like is this a six foot you know earth berm behind my house in front of my house um i think people would be a little upset if you just put it in their front yard and, and they were still in the floodplain <laughs> um so i think <clears throat> you know we were envisioning this would probably be behind the properties there's a lot of you know that that was part of next steps is to kind of dig into that next level of detail jane to see what is this going to look like what is the sentiment from the public understanding that yes, there may be an easement that needs to be taken, but they're gonna get flood protection out of it. There's a benefit. They will no longer have to pay insurance potentially. So <clears throat> I would, you know, but it's complicated. So you have a couple of stream systems that run through here too. So you're looking at some pump stations. You know, there's additional infrastructure. It's not just a pile of dirt. You'd have a road crossing that would go across um, Main Street here and, and you know, that's something that's that's additional infrastructure. It's visual impact, um, you know, but you would need to have a closure. You need to have an ability to, to put up a wall, a temporary wall during a flood event. You know, so there are aesthetic impacts. Um, we did talk about this last Selectman's meeting, uh, I mean, 2018. I don't know why I remember so much uh, from this, but um, this question came up and it was um, we sort of gave an estimate of how high we thought this would be. The, the dike is very tall along the river. <clears throat> but the f elevation starts to creep down as you get downstream, downstream the river, the river flows this way. So this is not a 10 foot embankment. You know, it's something six feet or less probably. And don't, don't hold me to that because we haven't updated the flood model, but, um, but that would be something that we would look at as part of this. And we included visualization of, of these things. So we could actually show people images and, and then show what it might look like um, adjacent to their property. So um, it's, it's a very good question. That, hopefully that answered that. For the time. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that was my question. What are the rough elevations going to be on Bay Road? Because I know the uh, rail trail and the existing dike were pretty close within an inch or so. Uh, that's why they were. you guys were going to use that originally. So... Yeah, so you can get a sense when you when you go down Dyke Road here, you can get a sense of how much elevation it goes up. So if you kind of translate that, John, to Bay Road, it'd probably be similar. But once you get at the end of Bay Road, it's much lower in elevation. Well, there's quite a transition from Bay Road, Bay Road and Middle Street, and Bay Road and Route Nine. You know, there's there's two distinctive elevations there, so. Yeah. Yeah. So what we would do is part of the next steps is we would evaluate those elevations and, and we come up with a concept which would say, you know, this is the approximate height based upon the, the terrain throughout here and the alignment of where we're proposing it so that we can see what is this going to look like along this corridor. Yeah, because the picture you have of Aquavita Road starting to flood, having watched floods, that end of... Um, West Street there really comes up fast. And I think you're going to yeah. need more than six feet there of any kind of support. No, once it starts consuming a larger quality quantity of land, it slows down. The initial flood comes up quickly, but then once it starts spreading out and then the rest of the way up to Bay Road, it comes real slow. Yeah, and, and so <clears throat> we look at the elevation at which it's going to finally rest at, and that, that's what determines, you know, the height of it. Um, you know, the, the volume is a different consideration, so it will fill a big area fast. Um, well, the last, the last time that it flooded was when we owned property on West Street, and it was back in the 80s that the, we had a real flood, and it came down uh, the common uh at that point and that's when you know i think that was the last big time it came up through that dike area there from from uh, the bottom of west street crossed over bay road and when rather crossed over bay road and onto west street that was back in the 80s that that occurred um and I, we haven't had anything since then that time luckily um but you know i was back on the right. board when you did the original study and uh, there for the break in the levee on West Street, mm -hmm. the other end. So, I mean, this definitely all needs to be looked at, but I don't want to infringe on the people that live there on Bay Road unless it is in the back of their yard, uh, protecting their properties, not in the front of their yard. Yeah, I think that makes the most sense. And, you know, this is, this is essentially a cost-benefit analysis feasibility study. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are some other... I mentioned some of these other deficiencies. Um, there's a need for some drainage improvements. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are catch basins at the end of West Street here next to the dike. Um, mm -hmm. There's supposedly valves that are probably inoperable at this point in time. <clears throat> so uh, there's also some culverts underneath the rail trail berm, 30-inch corrugated metal pipe culverts, two of them. Mm -hmm. And and they don't have closure structures. They, these things weren't envisioned in, as part of the design Fortunately, you haven't had a flood event that's that's crept up that high. Mm -hmm. um, so part of what we're going to look at is in this proposal is not just this feasibility of, of a new system along Bay Road and the cost of, of all these things, but is to come up with um, uh, recommendations and, and a preliminary design for things that, that, that the town could implement um, that are relatively small cost. You know, mm -hmm. so just having gates on these culverts, making sure the condition is okay, uh, investigating some of these things where the, they go through the levee. One of the other things that we proposed was um, a, a detailed inspection of the toe. We call the toe the bottom of the levee. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's something that should be done periodically, no matter what, as part of, you know, a, a three or five year plan. And, and to look at whether you have any erosion along the bottom, which is the first place it's going to fail. You know, so that's something that's that's in the recommendations in that 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 budget that we proposed. Um, that's an important thing to do. Don't you think that's true though? Because when they repaired the levee and they put the wrong uh, materials in there uh, to begin with, and then it eroded away, 
they ended up putting in steel uh, beams from top to bottom to support that part of the levee, which um, certainly makes you kind of think that somewhere along the road here, this, this levee is pretty old, um, that that's exactly what's happening all the way along, um, especially when you've got the turns in the river where it flows pretty heavily, um, that this would happen, right? right? Yeah, and, that, and so that's something that's part of routine inspection, but it requires getting in a boat, sending an engineer out there during yeah. low flow. Yeah. Looking at it for erosion, evaluating the condition, making sure there's no slumping and, and undercutting. But you're right. So this area here, I think it's roughly here, mm -hmm. uh, was where the previous failure was. And what they installed is what you described as a steel bulkhead. Mm -hmm. And so that drives steel sheeting, which yep. that's good for a while. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's very robust in this section. But even section. that can give way, you know. Yeah. yeah, eventually, yeah. yes, and, and it corrodes. And, but, but so that area is not much of a concern at the moment. Um, and, and again, we don't have, you know, ugh, extreme concerns about other areas, but we have unknowns as well. So that's, that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to address is the unknowns. Yeah. And these other areas, there's riprap, which, so it's, it's large stones, but even yeah. that can get eroded and, and mm -hmm. the bank underneath that can cut, can undercut. You know, mm -hmm. so the river is dynamic. <clears throat> um, the other, the other thing is, is, is let's not forget there's the old landfill right here. Yeah. So that's in this portion here, up against the up, up against the the dike essentially. So mm -hmm. we want to make sure that that area remains intact. Mm -hmm. And so whether the town chooses to maintain the system as is, without major capital investments, I mean that's that's an option. Um, the capital investment just may not be worth it to meet FEMA criteria. And we can say, okay, well, that's going to impact the public a little bit. And that's a decision that, that the public makes. Um, so there's a consequence, uh, you know, so, so, but you can still maintain it in its current condition. And even if it has quote unquote deficiencies, it just means it doesn't meet current design standards. It doesn't mean it's going to fail tomorrow. If you can maintain it the way it is, it's just doesn't meet design standards, which are the recommended standards. So mm -hmm. there's some level of risk that the community is still um, accepting. Mm -hmm. But it's an important piece of infrastructure to maintain properly. And so, so se several of these items are really related to ensuring that this is maintained properly, um, that you have a plan. And so, so DPW has been doing maintenance. It's, it's routine. It's, it, I would say it's minimal. Um, you know, some of these things are, require outside resources, um, engineers mm -hmm. to look at it periodically. So, so um, it, it needs to be enhanced a bit. So would you suggest in what, what we do uh, at a couple of times during the year, our, our uh, senator or our house of rep usually will say, hey, we're going to be putting in our budget, um, you know, certainly asking the state for some money so that we can um, get something from them so that we can at least do the study and see what we need to do on it. You know, we're going to be doing the budget tonight, I'm not sure how many extra pennies we're, we're going to have this year. Um, until we get into yeah. the budget, but um, certainly this is something that we have said right along that you can't neglect and let go. So um, I would like to at least explore the thought of our, our legislature helping us and um, at this point, because I think everybody's strapped for money at this point right now. How's everybody else feel? Everybody dead on there? No, I think I think when we had that failure, we we were talking about the the highest portion of that levee, uh, mm -hmm. maybe sheathing it and stepping it, that bank, so you can get in easier to maintain it at some point. I think they did a portion of it in two steps anyway. Yeah, a couple of the areas of that dike have been repaired over the years, even before two thousand nine. Correct, John, is what I'm remembering. Yeah, I, I'm just asking him about stepping that if we were, mm -hmm. you know, as we do the portions that fail, um, yeah. as we did in the past. Yeah. yeah, so so what were the recommendation to look at this this portion here? So so this 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 portion actually meets design standards. You know, this is this is sufficient. This is just really tall and too narrow. And and so that's the issue with the stability on along the river. Now the area that was repaired is is in good shape mm -hmm. um 
the options you're talking about, that's part of what we're suggesting is you, you evaluate the remediation option. So we call it remediation just in terms of how you would fix it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can stiffen the soil. You can increase the soil strength properties. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it requires <clears throat> what we call buttressing, which is, which is in flattening the slopes. But then mm -hmm. you're, you're creeping into the river. So you may need to do some structural revetment. You may need to step it um, and pull some of that back from it. And so you can structurally reinforce it. So that, but that's, that's something that requires a fair amount of analysis um, and to provide an accurate cost to do that for this, this length of levy mm -hmm. is, is what we're suggesting you do. So, so what you're saying makes sense. That's, that's its own analysis that, that takes a fair amount of effort. Mm -hmm. So what kind of problem do you get into doing all this river work with conservation? It's, it's, yes, permitting is fairly significant. So if you're doing, you know, you have dredging, you have, it's not just, it's, it's Army Corps permitting, it's Mass DP um, and conservation. Yeah, so, but it's higher, so, it's higher up than the, just the town level. We have to really, like you said, FEMA and DEP really are the uh, caregivers and goers of where we get our permitting from uh, more so than the town conservation, correct? Uh, for this, if you're in a river system like this, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Conservation has jurisdiction as well, but it's, it's also state and federal jurisdiction. Right. Minimal. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're proposing that this is going to be on the town warrant this spring for the uh, residents to vote on whether or not to spend $150,000? This, this is the project we suggested, which is... Um, less than what we proposed for that funding option I mentioned earlier. Um, that's really gonna help the town understand what direction you go in terms of um, upgrading the system, looking at the alternative along Bay Road, is it feasible? What's the cost benefit? So there's some part of this that um, you kind of have to do one to do the other and then incorporating some modest um, inspection to make sure that there's nothing else that, that, that is gonna be missed. So, but yeah, that's, that's the idea. This is what we suggested to, to Chris and Carolyn to put this in a position where, where you have a better maintenance program, which is something that you should have anyway. And then to look at what is the true capital investment and benefit potentially, and is it feasible so that we have a path to move forward potentially, and it puts you in a position to really um, leverage outside sources of funding for the next step. So to make it eligible. So some of this work is just not eligible the way it is at the, at the status it, it's currently at. And I don't know, Scott, if you want to chime in at all about funding and, and kind of sort of strategy behind some of this, it, you know, it is challenging to, to get these into the right program sometimes. So that was one of our sort of our goals with this approach. But my, right. my, 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 my question, my question is, oh, wait, oh, wait. go ahead, sorry. So I have a question about um, if we were to put this to the fall where most of our, when we know what our monies will be is most of the time we do do a fall town meeting. Um, we're Like I said before, we're just doing the budget tonight, um, not knowing where we're standing at this point with money and maybe would it give us more time to see what other federal funds are out there and approach our legislatures for um, the funding to get this done. Would that be a time frame where we could we could look at it then in the fall? Yeah, Scott, would you, do you want to weigh in a little bit on that? Because I mean, you've you've been, you've working, been working at the, at the state, state level, state level on, a lot, on a lot of things here. Yeah, I think um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and um, been sitting quietly by. Rich has been working with uh, you folks on this project for a long time. Um, I think one of the things that is a challenge is the funding uh, portion of this. And it's been a challenge for your community. It's been a challenge for most other communities with major projects that are facing them. Um, not to, to uh, dwell on the MVP program. You guys went through a, a engagement, an engagement, public engagement process to get a plan in place and uh, develop this uh, list of priority projects. This was your top project it's not fundable. Um, I think what we've seen over and over again, and I think uh, 
Carolyn's frustrated. And I think, you know, Chris is frustrated. The programs that are out there um, are becoming so competitive, even in this environment where we're in this recovery and there's lots of federal dollars floating around and there are earmarks. And you perhaps thought, heard about the federal earmarks uh, that were happening uh, at the congressional level. And I know the Senate will have earmarks coming soon. And I would encourage um you know, you to talk to your legislators um, to see what the federal potential is. Um, it's just a challenge to not have the information necessary for, for someone to jump in and fund. And I think Rich hit that earlier a little bit in kind of a broad um, commenting uh, piece, but it's really just challenging to not have um, some of the numbers you need, some of the data that you need, some of the feasibility information that you need. So you can wait. I mean, the answer is yes, you can wait until the fall. You can wait until the following fall. Um, we're just simply trying to, um, you know, point out that you know, time passage is causing more deterioration. Mm -hmm. And at some point in order to capture some of the funds based on our experience and work with, other clients. And we're pretty unique in the marketplace where we, we do have a full-time funding team that spends their entire uh, day, 40 hours plus a week, looking at funding programs and trying to understand and strategize the thought process of those grant funding um, uh, administrators to see how to best put clients in position to get money for these critical projects that face them. Um, one of the things that Rich said was deferred maintenance is typically a black mark for you when you have an application and they often look and say, hey, you've had a problem here and you don't even have an operation or maintenance plan, which is why you see that in the list of what we're talking about helping sort of develop. Um, they wanna see those things. And if you don't show that you have a real strong focus of investing, uh, you typically don't get funded through a grant uh, grant program. Uh, are there any other towns? Are there any uh, other towns um, that like us that, along the like us along the connect that have are having problems or have you um, done any work for them? I mean, we're not the only ones that would uh, have a problem if the river flooded. So has anybody else had any other things going on in any other towns or cities along the river? I think, Rich, that probably, I think that the other nearby communities are in the, the program with uh, the Army Corps, no? Yeah, yeah sorry. sorry. Scott, I was on mute. Because <laughs> uh, getting some feedback. Um, so when we started working with when I started working with you back in 2014, we, we talked to Hatfield about this. Um, Hatfield, uh, I'm not. They decided not to move forward with any 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 review of their system. Mm -hmm. Similar to, to you guys, they have a fair amount of agricultural land that's being protected um, by the by the levy and on their side of the river, and didn't see the need to do something at that time. Um, Scott mentioned whether this is in the Army Corps program. So this is a, a system that. Um, a levy that is not sponsored by the army corps so the army corps doesn't recognize it as part of their program um, and they built and they built it back in 1928 yeah right? yeah um so <laughs> let's take a look at northampton for example so northampton has significant um levy systems as well that protect their downtown area pump stations they've got road closures it's it's a big asset in in the city that's a core sponsored levy it's eligible for for funding but they still have to do a fair amount of work to get that money mm -hmm. so you know the army corps will come in and inspect it for them and tell them they have to do all the same things that that you would normally do just like we're saying here um there's a certain level of effort that the city has to meet in order to be eligible for those funds and a lot of it is related to maintenance mm -hmm. you know they uh funding agencies across the board don't want to fund capital investments if you can't demonstrate that you're currently maintaining things properly. Yeah. Um, and not that you're, you're doing a bad job. It's just there's more that needs to be done uh, to a higher standard. Um, and, and so um, one of the issues we had with this, when we reviewed this, we spent several hours with our funding team, myself, Scott. We spoke with Chris and Carolyn. We went through various programs. We also discussed that with the MVP coordinator when we submitted that application. And, the, and they gave us feedback and they said, you know, you need a, a better defined project right now. We don't know what the project is, is do we do Bay road? Do we upgrade the current system? 
you know, so agencies want to see a clearly defined project. They don't like the fund feasibilities quite often. Uh-huh. And so there's certain, I guess what we're suggesting is that there's a certain level of investment that the town needs to make to have a better defined project that is eligible for more funding. Uh-huh. Um, and, and we've kind of scoured what's out there now, you know, the last time, um, I reviewed this with the town was back in 2018 and, you know, an hour, three years later. And so, you know, it continues to kind of, um, you know, you know, you know, kick the can down the road, so to speak. And that that's not, you know, a bad thing if there's opportunities, but we're not seeing that at the moment. And, and we're trying to think of a way to advance it, to put you in the position to get more funding, I guess is really, you know, so, so you guys can, can put it on the fall we can continue to look for opportunities. Um, even some of those funding opportunities require match. So there would be some cash contribution that would, would be needed um, typically with most of those programs. So. Well, I'd like to, you know, continue this conversation. I think, uh, I think it's very important because I've been here since we did have the break and we have done things right along um, trying to keep afloat. But I think, you know, I agree with this study and, and again, protecting what we have in the center of town. And uh, so, you know, we'll meet with the finance committee tonight right after you. And if this needs to go on, uh, I guess my question will be for funding, how we would fund it. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm in support of this. So can I, if, David, do you want me to make a motion to that? I think we already have it on the warrant. Do we not? A place okay. to- All right. So. We're all in agreement with at least being on the warrant and we'll see where their funding comes from. Is that yeah, good? I think after we chat with the finance committee, if, if it's not doable, we can always yank it before town meeting. So, yeah. Or can, if we can fund it some other way, we'll have to look at that too. Yeah. I would strongly suggest that we have this uh, two page document to hand out to people who come to town meeting. So they get a better sense of it. If it is on the warrant. Yeah, we can do that. I printed mine off already today, so no reason we can't print it out for town meeting. Can, can you print another 100 for us, Joyce? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to have more than that, David. <laughs> I'm hoping we'll have more than that, that's for sure. Yeah, All right. We, we, we understand um, you guys need to consider this with finance, uh, and, and so we're happy to support the town in, in any way possible to help advance this. So <clears throat> those are our suggestions. Um, you know, appreciate the opportunity to to uh, speak to this with you tonight. All right. So and if we, if may we I need ask to... a question? Sure. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to barge in. I'm not a select person, but um, I just when we're considering some of you know what we're going to need in the future, can you just give us like a ballpark idea of what something like building the the dike along the back of Bay Road would be? I mean, do you have just like, you know, some kind of ballpark idea of what we're looking at? Um, the frightening uh, number. Likely yeah, a, a frightening a, a, number. A, I'm already <laughs> scared. Well, a, a big can... number. I mean, that, that's, that's why we're saying evaluate the cost benefit because it could be a big number, but it could provide a lot of benefit. And, and then you can make a decision, an informed decision. Um, it's not a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's, it's not a couple million. It's probably several million dollars because you're looking at potentially taking property right away, acquisition, uh, pump stations, probably a couple pump stations. Um, and um, just the earth construction and potential you know, utility conflicts, relocation, permitting is going to be significant. So it, it could be the tune of, of a few to several million dollars or more. So that, that's why we're saying, you know, let's look at it closely and see whether this is worthwhile and, um, and you know, based upon the potential benefits. So I think that's, that's probably the best we can answer. And, and really that number that you want is really part of what we're suggesting you figure out next. Mm-hmm. I, because and I, because, I don't, just, because just that few feet that we did in 2009 was over $600,000. And that was 2009. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that I think was- one one I think one thing that'll be very important, and I don't want to drag this out any longer than I know you, you have a big uh, full agenda. Um, I think it's important. The Bay Road, the cost overall needs to be considered after this phase, and then in the context of what might you gain, what might you lose, and by what might you lose, I think 
obviously DCR will be part of this conversation. If you, in fact, um, Bay Road uh, isn't the solution, but trying to get the rail trail up to meet standard. Um, as Rich said, it's an asset in your community. It is kind of a centerpiece in the community. It does see an awful lot of traffic and it it is a draw um, to the community. And I'm sure that has a significant business impact. And, you know, what do you lose if in fact you have to, you know, decimate the vegetation along the rail trail there and change the full character through the downtown. So there are monetary equations here that you'll be able to look at. Then there's also the intangibles there that you'll have to weigh as a community if you get to the point where we get to do this evaluation. Yeah. Well, Sounds good. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, the time. And uh, very, very informative. Thank you. Yeah, we, we should know uh, in the next couple of weeks whether or not it'll be on the uh, the warrant for this town meeting or not, based okay. on well, how the budget goes. David, thank, thank yes. you for having us. I, I, I do need you. to leave, so I'm going to leave. I actually have another meeting. <laughs> so, All right. Thank, 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 you, thank you very much. much. Enjoy your evening. Right, thank you. you. Hey. Jane, you had something? Uh, only if it goes on the warrant, I hope we can get them to come and describe it. Hey. Yeah. Absolutely. Like Shanna. Yes, yeah. that's that's they will absolutely be there to do exactly what they just did right now. And they'll have the Great. whole presentation. Excellent. We, Thank you. We wondered whether we'd find a way to be able to project our presentation and do it in like a PowerPoint. I understand you don't you haven't done that and it'll be outside, but we're we'll we'll be available if you require it. OK, thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good evening. All right. So we'll keep moving. Uh, how about Finance Committee? Are you guys still awake? Hopefully. Still here. All right. Good deal. The cat, yeah. the cat went home, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, I guess, Amy or Paul, do you want to start off and give us a, an update of where we are, what we're working on? Sure. So uh, everyone knows where we started. Uh, level funded, we asked for the departments. Level service, we asked for the departments. So we reviewed. Each department gave us a list of both. Um, we then uh, listened to the departments because, you know, in each one of them were, they put in a level um, funded, but it was clear that level service was needed to continue. Uh, we listened to the town administrator. She expressed her concerns and how it was very important to go with level service. Um, so we, um, as we also listened to the you know, we're here for the taxpayers and, you know, we listen to select board. There's some uh, select board members, too, that are concerned um, for the taxpayers where we are. We asked for Dan to, you know, Dan gave us a great sheet, a chart on what this is going to mean to our taxpayers and, you know, what's an average tax bill. So that was a big part of it. Uh, so we looked at all those. We looked at all those things. Um, what I wanted to point out is, you know, the finance committee took this very seriously. We went all over all the line items. We are, we are not what you call a rubber stamp committee. We are not just going to say, okay, whatever you say goes. We're, we asked questions. We asked a lot of questions. Um, it wasn't easy, especially, you know, we listened to everyone. And then last night it, it wasn't easy to, you know, there was some things we brought up, but I wanted to point out that, um, that we, you know, it was when it was pointed out, it was pointed out, we tried to look at, and we just brought it up for questions for all departments. Um, and it's not one department that we're picking, you know, wanted to say, oh, it's one department we're going after. You know, schools were level funded um, right away. So, you know, the school department. Uh, DPW, we had a question on, you know, we got, we, we started looking at the trees. Um, Council on Aging, we had the, um, the ask questions about, you know, their van and, and the rebates. Uh, the library, they, we talked about the possible for a waiver. Park and Rec, we, you know, it was, um, we were gonna look at uh, reducing their um, line item by um, salaries in 10,000, but it was already, they, um, it looks like they beat us to the punch. So they, they already took care of that. So that was good. So that wasn't too much of a discussion. Um, Town Hall, we looked at HR and we brought up police and fire. Now, you know, we mentioned fire, maybe receipts, and then we also looked at police. I didn't even see anything in there, but I didn't want to leave them out because we're mentioning all departments. So 
I didn't, uh, but basically, so we went through and we did all departments. You know, the easiest ones to look at, to cut back on would be obviously OPEB. We did that and uh, we went to the fin finance committee reserve. So we would look at doing that too. Those are the, those are the easy ones. And then the rest of them, it was a lot of discussion, um, a lot, it, it, and, and it goes all ways. So I just, we could probably go, I'm hoping to show it to you, um, to go down and Linda, I'm guessing would have the list. And even since we did this, there was a couple of small changes, but maybe she could share the list. And um, if anybody else wants to chime in, please do so. Okay, so you want me to sh uh, share your budget sheet? That'd be great. Um, is this up for discussion tonight? Yes. Let's see how that is. I do want to point out, I mean, with all this, we are using, you know, we are using um, certified free cash. We're using anticipated free cash. We are not all doing OPEB. We're not looking, you know, so there's a lot. <laughs> there's a, but what we do value is I wanted to point out, we value the employees, right? We want to, we feel that, you know, that all employees should get a COLA. Even if we don't want to punish, you know, people that aren't union employees, they should, they all should get a COLA. And, and, and the people that work those hours should get paid for all the hours that they do work. And so, you know, we don't really know, we tried to do the best we could um, by, you know, um, seeing what, what we could put off to the fall, because we are hoping in the fall that we will be getting some money, um, from the government, you know, to help out. And we're also hoping that um, our, our revenues are gonna be up a little bit, you know, with things getting back to normal. We're hoping that the meals tax goes up and, and the um, room tax. So we're, we're hoping for better revenues. So we're pushing a lot, some of this off to the fall is what we're hoping to do. So specifically okay. you're pushing off things like um, stabilization and reserves replenishment an OPEB, yes. An OPEB. Is there anything on here for um, the new building maintenance? There is, but there's not a lot. There is all, there is building maintenance and each one has some, but it is not a large amount. And what we, we did have a discussion that, you know, this is how we're going to get through this right now, but it is so important that we look at starting up a some type of, and they said, you know, Linda thought maybe we could look into that, that we start to look at some type of reserve for building maintenance for things like big projects, even in painting town hall or in, in, in you know, right now, all our building maintenance will, what is not used, will just go back to free cash. So there is some building maintenance for every day, but it doesn't doesn't keep saving. And so when we have big projects, we have no money to do them. I think that's a good plan to have a reserve fund just for buildings. Things like when the fire department needed their generator a couple yeah. of years ago, if there was money that could have just happened. Mm -hmm. All right, let's start on the budget. Linda, right. can you make it a little smaller so it all fits on my screen or move it over or something? Let's see. Uh, let, let me just play and you tell me when it's good. I'm moving That's it perfect. to the, perfect. the left. Perfect. Oh, okay, whoops. Did I go too far? No. Nope. All right, you. I'll stop right there then. So. so we have very, I mean, you've probably seen a lot of this budget before um, when, they, when the town administrator presented it and it was presented um, and you will go down and see the finance committee budget. Um, and if most of them, we just took whatever the town administrator's budget and we moved it over there. We, we did, uh, try, you'll see some votes and some things where we changed it, where we thought that might be something we could do. So anyways, if you wanna scroll, the first thing that was changed that we looked at was the uh, reserve fund. Um, we were at 50 um, and until the pandemic, we moved um, it up to 75. Okay, so it, it was moved up and it was recommended to move up again to 100 
and that's the reserve fund. And if it's not used, it just goes back to free cash. It's a great idea because if such as, you know, I know like the trees right now is a big problem for the um, DPW, we might end up with having to help out there. We've had a few, we had HR in here. We had to move some things from reserve that we didn't count on, but we haven't used a lot of it right now. Not, I mean, we haven't done the trees or anything, but right now we have not used a lot of the 75. It's very small amount. So maybe we will be okay. So we said, well, let's just try 85. So that's where we went with that. Okay. So let's you know, keep... it depends on what the line transfers are going to be in everybody's budget, because in some lines they have money that they haven't expended at all. And in other lines, they're uh, over, over budget, you know? Mm -hmm. So you need to take all of that into consideration in all the departments. So. Mm -hmm. Which, which is true, which is why people were the last resort for the fund, uh, for the fund, um, for the reserve. Usually sometimes they take it and they transfer it within their own budget or something. But, you know, our history of it, we don't always have it always spent. Okay, I just wanted to say it's usually a lot of it goes back to free cash. Well, I appreciate it showing the vote like this. That's nice to see what the support was for, uh, for something, you know, from the finance committee. It's nice. Yeah. So if, what, if you don't see a vote, that means everybody, you know, a lot of these that just moved over, we all were in agreement and it wasn't really, it, it didn't go to a vote. There was no change. Why was there such a decrease in the human resource salary? So that was the next thing we looked at. So the de the human resource salary, where we were going with that is we thought that this we looked at last year's um, and we went down 20,000. And the reason for that being is we thought that that could be a part-time or 1099 contracted um, uh, position. Before uh, 2019, we never had an HR person. Then we went to a full-time HR person. Last year, we ended up with a part-time because uh, just you know due to circumstances, and we ended up getting through last year with a part time. I'm just proposing, we're propose we are proposing that we relook at this and go to a part time, more of a, like I said, a um, 1099 contract status. We would be saving in uh, not just benefit, we'd save in benefits, pension, all that. And it would be um, the, um, like it was last year. So the, um, it would still, the, it would be the same for the, we have the uh, benefits person that handles everything that has been doing it for years and years and years. She would, it would still be, that would be completely the same. We're only talking about um, moving the director's position to a contracted position, part-time, more of the 1099 status, just to be similar to what we had last year. But we hired, we hired this person as a full-time person. Now you're asking that person to take a part-time job, which would mean that we would need to repost that position as a part-time position. Well, what we were looking at is a, is a 1099 position, more of that was what we were presenting, is not, a, not an employee, but a 1099 contract um, position. And it would be a, and, it, and the only reason why it was brought up was because of the contract you know, we wouldn't do it in the middle of someone's contract, but that contract was up at the end of the year. It, if, if it's possible, could I uh, have a few moments to speak a few words? This is Ed with HR. Sure. Ed, I think we're going to go into detail on this and uh, hash it out later. This is just going over what they're they're working on. So I, we're not going to go into, I, I guess, department heads making their, their cases right now for or against these cuts, I don't think, um, unless that was the plan, Amy, tonight. No, well, no, I just wanted to tell you that was, it was all of this is, 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 is what we discussed. It's recommended. It's not anything. It's uh, the later will be discussed with select board and to yeah. take it further. It's not. I it mean, was, that, that's fair, but there's already a few errors in facts, Amy. Deb was not 1099. Deb was on payroll. Deb is retired and can only work so much and earn so much. Um, and no discredit to Deb. She certainly accomplished a lot, but there's also a lot Deb didn't take on. 
And the second point I'd like to make, Amy, is my executive session hasn't been released and the status of my contract is not public record. So how do you know about it? Well, it, we with your your we we just looked at what the we have a co I have copies of um, from public record of contracts when they go out. Yep, and it's neither been confirmed nor denied whether my contract's been renewed. It's oh, not a matter I, of I don't have record. that information. I only have what was on the contract, so that's why it was presented. I don't have additional information on anything else. Right. I just have what was on a contract. So if there was something else, I'm not aware of. I'd like it to propose. Was, it was made very well aware in your in your meeting, Amy, that uh, the select board knew that this was coming. So you have information that's not public record. All right. No, so I, I, I pulled the contract from. Um, so that's what I did. All right, Ed. This is not the place to have that conversation uh, on that topic. So um, let's. Fair enough, David. Let, let's. I understand. But we will have that discussion. Yeah. Can I speak to the, I was the one person who voted against this. Can I speak to the logic just so there's an alternative yeah, sure. point? Um, my logic was uh, Hadley's growing. You guys moved, moved to a full-time position at some point in time in the past few years. Uh, every single department head that we have met with has said that there are needs for more staffing as we move forward. Everyone has been very understanding and worked with Carolyn to get their budgets under control. But as we begin to open up and we have more receipts and more revenues uh, and we have to provide more services for a growing town, the linchpin for all that is in human resources. And there is intangible value that uh, having talent at the HR position that will bring us. It's hard to see because there's no direct sales line item that's gonna uh, be on the other side of the HR director's role, but there is cost savings and value brought in CBA negotiations and decreasing any sort of uh, uh, complaints or issues within the town. So I just think it's it would be prudent for the long-term interest in the town to keep a full-time position, keep a talented person, uh, look forward to the growth that we're going to see in this town. That's my position. I concur. This morning by federal agents armed with a search warrant. They seized his electronic devices, including... We got the news going? <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, thanks, Dylan. No, I appreciate that. Um, Amy, you want to keep hitting the next ones, the recommended changes? Sure. So the next one would, you got to keep going. I don't remember where it is, well, oh, sure. but that's why I put the voters in there. So we'll, we'll get there. Okay. Yep. Like I said, we discussed uh, police. We did not seem to, and we moved, we did not find there wasn't anything that we could find in a line item. There wasn't anything we discussed that. Um, the fire, same thing. Uh, yeah. It is something that we discussed possibly uh, talking about if the receipts might be a little low, but um, that would be something on the other end. I just wanted to mention, we just did discuss those. Um, school is level funded. And then the next thing we went to was uh, DPW down there, which was, uh, let's see. That was the main discussion on that was we were looking to see and um, it was more of we were looking at um, there was a large increase in the one line item for the trees. Um, it was a uh, but we left it the same. It was a four to one vote um, where we talked about it was there was it was still funded, but the trees increased that um, line by 15,000. It, it was, I, I was the one that put the suggestion in, could we lower it by 10,000? Um, the increase lowered by 10 and just do an increase of five. But um, they felt like mo the majority of the group felt like it was better to leave it um, for the maintenance in the future to keep maintaining it. So um, then we will, there's nothing else. Um, until we get to keep going. Council on aging. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll be right back. The council on aging, we, oops, is uh, that, I mean, the, the bottom line is 124, 641. But the question was, 
is they did a, a fabulous job on getting this grant. So they have uh, this van, the van that goes out and for about $11,000, $11,000 they fund it. Um, and PVTA um, has um, agreed that they're going to do a 100% grant. So that's fabulous. So I was, when we were looking at it, we were hoping that we could show a wash. If you're going to show it in the expenses, we could show it in the revenues. Um, but it looks like because the way it comes in, which is kind of, you know, it is something that I, don't, I guess I can't completely understand, but we have to show it in the expenses. But when it comes in, it goes into a special account, which I don't believe we can touch. And then it automatically has to wait to get to be in, into uh, free cash once it's certified and then it goes to free cash. So I'm really not sure how, why, you know, I guess we can't put grants into the revenue side. Um, and so uh, we left that number alone, but it is pretty much a wash because it will be coming. It's just a shame that it, we have to make it go through free cash to get it. <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions on that. Uh, so Council on Aging, Library and Park and Rec. So now library, uh, we just, it was just brought up from library. Um, on library, it was brought up uh, because we taught, we, we heard that they, you know, there is waiver possibility. So we were talking to all the departments, not just one, we did it to all. So, um, and, you know, we, I threw out the number there, but it wasn't like it's a set number. It was just the number that we threw out. So, um, but it does not look like it's going to be able to, uh, everyone got an email from Patrick showing that it would cause too much of a problem um, to do a waiver. Now, I don't know if there was a, another amount. I didn't see that he proposed any amount, um, but um, for any waiver, but it didn't look like there would be able to, he said they could do a waiver possibly, obviously not for that amount, but if there was an amount, I'm not sure. Um, but it didn't, you know, um, look like it was gonna be something we would be able to do. So we, we just, at this point, I would say move it over. We have the full funding of what was recommended by the town administrator. Um, park and rec, you don't see anything there because it was already adjusted um, in the town administrator. But when we originally looked at it, it wasn't adjusted, but they made an adjustment to it because of the way the hours were. So instead of the 37 and a half hours, it brought back the salaries to more of a 30 hours. Um, so it's approximately 10,000 that was cut out of there. Um, and that had to do with uh, the school was not, um, they were not doing that agreement with the school anymore where for the after school program. Amy, does, uh, does Park and Rec have a revolving fund of some sort where the, the fees for programs go back to pay, I don't know, additional hours or salaries or anything like that? Or how does that work? They have a revolving fund program, but I don't believe that they take the salaries out of it. I think it's just for. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Want me to? Go ahead. I'm pretty sure it's just for programs. Yeah. Can I answer? <laughs> it it was uh, for a long time. It was everything came in through revolving account, and the salaries were paid out of it. But uh, at some point, about ten years ago, we were losing track of who's. Uh, we, we had employees that were being paid out of our revolving accounts, and yet their benefits and everything else was coming out of the general fund. So to get a better handle on it, it was decided to put it over in the general fund. The rest of the fees still go through the revolving accounts, and then at the end of the year, when there's excess in that revolving account, it's paid back into the general fund and goes into free cash, similar to what Amy was explaining about what happens to council, uh, the, the, um, the grants, some of the grants. So it has, it goes through the revolving account. There is excess in that and we, we sweep it at the end of the year. So you never see it as revenue. However, we come out a little bit ahead. Okay. All right. So I, I 
talked with one of the park commissioners a couple of weeks ago about possibly increasing some of the fees for some of the programs. So that would, that would help, but just not till the end of the year, basically, as far as uh, generating some revenue for the programming, right? The way we have it set up now. Right. Is, okay. That's true. Okay, that's all I have for that, sorry. Keep going. All right, so that was that was pretty much it. And then uh, the, oh, oh, the OPEB. The OPEB. Uh, but the, Linda, you wanna go ahead and explain that? Cause there needs to be a change, um, Linda said afterwards, we need, that we weren't, on, we did not understand yeah. as of last night. Yeah, and, and, it, and it didn't occur to me. It's, and we're, we're talking about so many things at once and uh, Dan actually brought it up today and he's, he's absolutely right. That the reason we had it at 16,890 last year was that is actually the enterprise contribution to the OPEB fund. And then we, then it's in the, um, uh, the chargebacks, the, what do we call it? The inter fund receipts where the transfers between the departments. Um, we get paid back for it through the receipts. So the two choices are either to put the 16,890 back in and that then, then we're balanced again, or if we're going to leave it out of here, then we have to take it out of the section of the revenues way at the top, which we call interfund enterprise receipts. So you understand we either have to have it in both places or we didn't really save the 16,000 by taking that out of OPEB because now I'm gonna have, we, now we have to go back up and, and take it out of the um, receipts. So it makes no difference in the bottom line of the budget. It looked like we were coming ahead, but not at this point, Amy. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just, um, you know, I, I didn't, there was just, we have, we have so much we're thinking of at once, but. So what's our bottom line difference between uh, I guess the, the three options here, you know, the level fund, the town administrator's budget and the finance committee's budget. What, what, are, what are the actual dollars difference here? Okay, let's, uh, we had that, didn't we, Amy? Well, uh, we had that uh, right there. It is difference. Let me just get up to that line. Ah, yep. Seven hundred thousand more from level fund. Right, and I think it's three something. I was at the bottom, Linda, but you have to add in the sixteen. Just add in the sixteen, and it'll change it from three twelve to three hundred and twelve thousand. There it is. Okay, so if I add, so if you add the sixteen, okay. eight ninety, and it's going to go a little bit lower. Eight nine, uh, eight ninety. So the difference between uh, the town administrator's recommended budget and now this, the the uh, finance committee's is two hundred ninety five thousand, almost almost three hundred thousand. My question that everyone's going to be asking, as from the taxpayer perspective, is and maybe Dan, I think Dan's on here. Dan, uh, could you maybe give us an idea of? ballpark what the tax rate would be to, to be able to, or what the increase would be needed to pay for the administrator's budget versus the increase that would be needed to pay for the finance committee's budget, something along those lines. Oh, it, it's tough to answer at this point. I mean, I can give you the number with the 600,000, but we're gonna be getting money in from ARPA with that we're not sure how we're gonna be able to use sometime between now and I would say July 1st. And the, the meeting that we attended last week indicated that they were gonna give us revenue replacement for based on fiscal 19 revenues or receipts. So we're looking at between meals and motel, probably about 550,000. So that money could be used for, if it is true revenue replacement, virtually anything. And I think that the state legislature, when they decide how this is going to use, they tend to favor Boston. And right now, Boston has an awful lot of hotels that are vacant that aren't paying. And I think they're going to say that motel, hotel, motel excise is going to be free reign for revenue replacement, that you're going to be able to use it for whatever you want. So you could use that money to supplement the difference between what you had indicated the 401, which is the 2.5% increase, 
and the 600,000. And then use that money again in the fall to restore OPEB or any other cuts that might have been made. And, and it, to the funding. Because that's, Amy, I followed through. If you look at the uh, raise and appropriate line, which includes the taxes, I followed through with a reduction in taxes that you were talking about last night, which is similar to what Dan has incorporated into what he explained. Would, Do you want to go over how you did that? If it's strictly tax dollars, it would be $168 for the average house versus 102 if you went with two and a half percent increase. So strictly tax dollars would be $168 increase for the administrator's budget or for the finance committee? For budget? the finance budget. Okay. And for the administrator's budget? Uh, administrator's budget is going to be $263. 206 is that what you said? Uh, 263 263 Okay. And that's not taking into account any of that ARPA or whatever you said? Any, yeah, any, any ARPA funds that will be available for revenue replacement. Okay. Right. And so our swing figure here has been um, when finance committee reduced the budget, um, they chose to put the savings not out of how much free cash we're using, but put it to put it back up in the taxes raised, which means in both budgets, we have um, not only are we using the rest of what's already been certified for free cash, but we're using what's called anticipated free cash, which isn't really something we're going to be able to, we can't, uh, that, that's, that's just money that we know we're going to get. So I don't know exactly how we apply that, but we're going to have to apply it. Um, if we can get the ARP, uh, if we, depending on how we do with ARPA funds, we are certainly comfortable that we are going to have at least that amount uh, additional and free cash as of July 1. Um, you, you know, the other option is to cut the, you know, cut all that 528 out of uh, 528,000 out of the budget and restore it in the fall. But that was going to, that wreaks such havoc with the operations that um, it made, it's probably better to use the higher budget and then fill in afterwards. Um, if I could go over to the general funds our general revenue to sort of support what Dan was just saying on our uh, revenue, the revenue replacement feature of um, ARPA funds. You see our revenue back in 19 from rooms act of rooms excise, 840,000 we received. And um, if that's our measure, and then this year, we budgeted 450. And then for next year, since we may come up short, we're budgeting 350. That's a lot of revenue replacement that we would be entitled to. So we're, we're hurting now for, um, for, for two reasons. One was the reduced revenues and, and then also the reduced taxes. The reduced taxes, if we start making it up a little bit, that's great. And if they're, if the government's going to help us in replacing the revenues, lost revenues, we're going to make that up quickly. And then it's going to restore itself. I would hope we would back up to that 850 itself for the following year. So our goal in this short run is to get from where we are now to, to where we want it to be running. Really, we're looking ahead to 50, FY23. The 22 budget is going to get us to where we need to be in 23. So, so one of the I guess pledges that the select board had made was to replenish stabilization yep. uh, when possible yep. and also to continue funding OPEB. So yep. in your opinion and Dan's opinion um, and, and the rest of the finance committee, if uh, these projections hold true with the revenue replacement, the, um, you know, either the town administrator's budget or the finance committee budget and free cash and whatever else, Will we be able to fulfill that pledge or that promise to replenish that stabilization and get get done what we have here shown in the budget? And that's what that's. I know there's a lot to. You want say. me to say yes? <laughs> well, I, know, I want your best guess, really. I know, I know it's a it's a guess. Um, that's 
that's the plan. That's the plan it, because of the kind of, because of the reasons that we have lost this money and because of the way we are seeing it come back already. We were really pleased with where the March revenues came out. And um, you know, Susan's already looking to motor vehicle excise being ahead of our revised projections. Um, and I'd only pointed out the meals excise. Um, remember that uh, your board did a, a fair amount of waiving and reducing a certain number of fees to help the local businesses. Those can be restored and come back. Uh, I know finance committee spent some time last night on the on the fire receipts. That's one of the ones that was reduced. So how how much would it be? Um, I don't I don't know. Um, it, more um, inspections is growing. We're getting a lot of the building inspections. Um, one thing I'm not sure came up, uh, it was with anything that went to select board yet. I'm sorry, I don't remember who it wrote to on which, but we, we added electrical um, inspection fees to the inspection receipts also another 40,000. And the expenses against that in the inspections budget is only 15. So, I mean, so we, we worked at increasing that. So yeah, we're really hoping that we start to see a rebound. Um, look at select board receipts. Um, we're, we have budgeted 125,000 for last year. Two years ago, it was 141. We should see that start picking up again, especially since there was an increase in receipts in the meantime. Um, you know, just even little things, clerk receipts, budgeting debt less than we had in 19. When the economy starts to come back and these things start to be spent again, and um, and, and we have the uh, fees set to where we expect it to be. That'll be good. Look at us with cannabis. Zero. We are actually going up in that area. So that's going to be a new area for us. Um, Hopefully the ambulance will pick up as well. So we'll ambulance pick. could be a possibility. So, I mean, between all of these things, um, there's every reason to be optimistic. I mean, I, certainly possible everything could fail at once, but we don't think it's going to happen that way. So we need to, we want to have the town ready to, Ready to, ready to continue business at that level. So, um, um, can we? I think it's important that all the departments that charge fees for you know permit fees, other other receipts, that we all take a hard look at those yeah. fees though, and that we are generating the uh, our our potential revenue that we could be generating, and. Um, I, I know people are hearing that as, you know, we're raising fees, but a lot of those fees are not even paid by people that live in Hadley. You know, so a lot of these building inspection fees for, uh, you know, the Walmarts of the world and the targets that are being remodeled and all the permitting fees and things like that. So yeah, some of it's passed down to their customers, but, um, you know, it, it's not necessarily directly hitting our, our taxpayers in town. So I think we need to look at all the fees and be squeezing out every last bit that we can. I know we added fees for liquor license change fees, a hundred dollar fee there. And so when, you know, mm -hmm. Chipotle changes their liquor license person every other month, uh, you know, we're making some money out of that. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. So I, I, yeah. I think we do need to take a hard look at where we can squeeze some more money out of. Right. I'd like to, can I bring up this right at this time? Um, maybe not tonight, but down the road, um, the fire department, the ambulance, uh, we really now in the next couple of years need to look to have our own BLS, which is basic life support ambulance for ourselves. It would also bring in revenue because we are still outreaching to the surrounding towns for assistance at some times. Um, this also would bring in, be bringing in revenue. And we've had an opportunity to get a rig uh, at, a, at a decent price um, from another town, city. And, you know, these are things that, you know, I'm looking to re increase our revenue also. Mm -hmm. And please let's keep this on the burner. Um, and I want to have this discussion in another couple of weeks where we can look at this, okay? Yeah, I mean, if, if departments can bring us ideas or solutions, you know, in the next couple of weeks of fees that can be increased, ways to increase receipts, then, uh, you know, maybe for the coming year, we can right. get a better revenue picture. I don't know. But right. yeah. well, 
you know, some of it will take care of itself. You saw that with the ambulance rebate in 20, look how much yep. we, we made there and look yep. what it's down to now. That's, that's going to take care of itself. There's nothing that anyone can do to make that go higher. It's just, it's going to be restored when the students come back and the population comes back and, and business starts to happen again. That's right. So, that's right. And, and then we'll need, you know, it'll be a, a, even a more incentive for us to look at that. No, and I know that um, Carolyn has had a uh, kind of a tight leash on spending, uh, you know, all around in all the departments. And so that's mm -hmm. helped as well. And, um, you know, that's just the reality we're in, unfortunately. I know the departments still want to hear that they're being kind of micromanaged on the, on the spending, but it's, you know, that's our reality at this point. Every dollar is counting here. So, uh, you know, what, what people don't spend this year may mean keeping something additional next year. So Sounds good. So up for further discussion at our, at our next meeting, uh, finalizing the budget, correct? Yeah. Um, finance committee, what do you, what do you guys see? How many more meetings do you have to kind of iron things out? What's our next step? Uh, well, I don't, right now, uh, we haven't seen the um, warrant yet. So we were, we have not scheduled another meeting um, until we could see the warrant. Um, that's what would be the next step. Um, we're up for, if you wanted, this is, this is it. This is what we did. And so basically if you have more guidance for us, if you would like us to look at something else, we would, but you know, we're using all of the cash, the anticipated free cash. The, basically we're saying, do you want to push off OPEB to the fall? Um, and that's your, that's the big one and, and, uh, take that, um, you, you could take, if you wanted to, if you want to rather say the push off the OPEB to the fall and then minus off the anticipated free cash and lower that number, that would be up for discussion. Or, uh, I thought you might want to, um, lower in the anticipated raise in appropriate revenues. So I guess it's, it's, the next, we want to hear what the select board has to say, what their thoughts are on it. So this this is our budget for now. Okay. So then why don't we, would the finance committee be willing to join us on uh, May 5th, which is our next meeting to, uh, Carolyn, do you think the warrant will be ready by then? Yeah, she's shaking her head, so. Yes, it should be ready by uh late Thursday or Friday. I had sent that out to everybody that it should be in, I would anticipate it by Friday. Okay, so then I think um, May 5th will be, we'll try to keep it somewhat clear on the agenda because we're gonna, that'll be the night for some hard conversations on what direction we wanna, you know, what final decisions we wanna make as far as these uh, budget choices. Does that sound reasonable for the rest of the board? I can yeah, make much, what time does that start? Um, well, 5.30 is when we typically start. Sure. If you need Great. to start the finance committee later, that's fine. Whatever. No, no, 5.30 is better. Okay. So me, can, I, can I actually get a, uh, when the warrant is printed out, may I get a hard copy and pick it up at Town Hall, please? Of course. It's kind of hard to look at those things on this little freaking iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to show you how to do it on it is hard. laptop too. I'm here for you. Oh, you know, I'm here for you too. <laughs> All right. Does that sound like a reasonable path forward? We'll have the uh, we'll make kind of make our final decisions next week after we have the warrant in hand, and uh, if the finance committee could be here as many people as possible for guidance on those decisions, that would be great. That'd yeah, be good. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks uh, to all the finance committee members for all the time you've put in on it, and uh, we'll see you in next week, I guess. Bye bye. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. All right. Um, anybody here from the library waiting to speak? As, Tommy, you're here, right? Thought I saw him somewhere. I think that's Patrick is here. Okay. Yeah, Pat, Patrick was actually going to speak a uh, represented when I talked to him today. He, he yeah, was here. I just got an email from Patrick late this afternoon. Actually, I just read it, but it it's just a follow up to your letter, Tommy, of the uh, check sheet. 
So uh, Tommy, why don't you tell us what's the outstanding problems or issues that you see, you've see you seen with the library uh, building project. We, we asked that this be discussed tonight because we're getting down to the wire here on, a, on punch lists and taking care of some exterior items. So Tommy, tell us, tell us what's left and what's in the works and kind of give us the status. Patrick's actually uh, been working on them with myself and Scott and the signs taken care of. The, the big thing right now, and he's reached out to um, Mark Sullivan, I believe it is. Um, yeah, Mark, about the uh, what the loan was supposed to be there because there's still areas that you know just have gravel and and you know they need to put the proper thickness of uh, David Tommy, loam on I'm there. So, I'm sorry to interrupt, Patrick. Just got kicked out. If y'all could give him just a second, he asked if you could just give him a second to get back into the meeting. Sure. Yeah, that's okay. fine. So we're, we're, we're moving forward, you know, with it now. So the signs are ordered. Um, and he is, like I said, right, reached out to, to find out the depth. I mean, we can look it up. Uh, Scott and I were going to try to have time this afternoon, and we didn't. And then we found out that he reached out to the OPM to find that out. So there was there was a loan depth specified in the contract? Yeah, it, it should have been in the, in the specs. Right. So rather than just say there's not enough there, we're going to find the exact amount. And, and hopefully Mark will take care of it with the landscaper or go to the you know the general contractor and take care of that okay well well i guess we'll give him just a minute to pop back up here he was in the meeting but he was um oh was he on his phone was that the he was on his phone and he was he was muted and he just couldn't get it to unmute i got you okay so he was just trying to go out and come back in right. how about if we do that creating a his local historic district want to get out off, off the books <laughs> Yeah, um, we can do that. And um, Diana uh, West is here. And anybody else from the historical? Hi, uh, yes. Thank you. Um, Denise Barstow and Stacey Cooney, I believe, are also on the call from Historical Commission. So I did send out some notes ahead of time to Jennifer for the select board to look over. And that will be essentially what I'm presenting today. And the Historical Commission is looking into creating a local historic district in Hadley, specifically in the center of town, to include uh, Russell School, the First Congregational Church, Town Hall, Farm Museum, uh, the Goodwin Building, formerly the library, uh, and the V1 Vodka slash St. John's Church. Um, if the district has to be a perfect rectangle, then that would also include the Dunkin' Donuts Building and the house next to V1 Vodka. As the Dunkin' Donuts building is not uh, technically a historical building, it would be known as an intrusion and uh, it wouldn't be held to the same standards as the other buildings within the district. So right now those buildings all lie within what is a national historic district, but that is mainly a symbolic designation. And it really only comes into play if uh, you want to demolish the building as happened with uh, Hooker School a couple years ago. So with a local historic district, this would create a uh, historic preservation commission. And essentially what that would do, it would approve any alterations that would uh, alter the um, historical character of the buildings that are within the district. So this does not include uh, anything like paint color. Uh, it doesn't include routine maintenance and it doesn't include anything that you cannot see from the road. So uh, why do we think that Hadley needs a local historic district? So this really opens up property owners to grant opportunities and other state and federal money. Uh, it's also the first step in having Hadley designated at a as a certified local government, which would again open up the town to grant opportunities, state and federal money that could be used to preserve town buildings and public spaces. So moving forward from here, we would need to alert property owners that we are looking into creating a local historic district. The select board needs to vote to create a study committee for the local historic district. That does not mean that it's Set in stone in any ways. This, at this point, we would just be uh, doing a study on the possibility of creating one. Uh, then we would invite property owners as well as members from the Hadley Historical Society, Board of Realtors, and the American Institute of Architects. Uh, those groups are required by the Massachusetts Historical Society to 
be invited to join the study committee, as well as any other interested parties. They would then have 30 days to submit their nominations, and then the select board would be the one who appointed the members of the study committee. The study committee works with the Massachusetts Historical Commission to create a survey of the area, so what buildings are in it, uh, what their historical characteristics, all the, the basically the history of the buildings and their architectural features. And then ultimately, this would need to pass a bylaw by two thirds majority at town meeting to create the district. And overall, the process takes about 18 to 24 months. So we wanted to come to this meeting, just provide you with this background and then invite anybody who'd like to join us at our next historical commission meeting on May 18th to uh, further discuss this and then hopefully move forward with the process. Does anybody have any questions? So I, I, I like the idea. And the one concern I have is, you probably can guess it, Russell School. Um, if we were to make it a historical district or yeah, a historic district, then our hands would be tied as far as our options for Russell School, correct? As far as what we could do with the building. Yes. All right. So is there a way, and I, I like the idea of moving forward, but we need to decide as a town what we're gonna do with Russell School before, in, in my opinion, before we preserve it forever and then we can't do something that maybe the town would like to do. So is there a way to move forward with creating a historic district that doesn't include Russell School at least to start with? I mean, we could go that decision. Um, we, as a historical commission, did look at this area because we are very concerned about Russell School and its future. And we have had a couple um, town citizens join us at our meetings also with concerns about Russell School. Uh, we did, we were considering West Street as a possibility to create the local historic district. Uh, but as concerns about Russell School were brought to us, we moved our attention to the center of town. Um, there's also in general, less property owners we have to alert and include in the process in the center of town as well. Uh, that was a concern about looking at West Street and starting there. Uh, so, I mean, we can exclude Russell School, but we really don't want to. And well, I get didn't that. It say 18 to 24 months before anything would actually happen. That might force the select board to act quickly. Yes, yeah, so the whole process could take up to 18 to 24 months. So that essentially means like 24 months from now, two years from now, that is when we would pass that bylaw at town meeting and then we would have to submit that, um, the town clerk submits that to the state to um, be put in as um, a bylaw for the town. And then the study committee um, becomes the uh, preservation commission meeting, uh, excuse me, um, the preservation, whatever it's called, um, the new commission for the actual historic district. And uh, so, yeah, so we do have quite some time before that would officially go into effect. I had a couple of questions about maximizing the CPA and also um, using, uh, I thought we already had an historic district many years ago, the former historic commission. Uh, it ran from West Street to Spruce Hill as what was considered our uh, historic district in the center of town. Is that correct? Are you realizing that also? So that, from what I understand and from what the Massachusetts Historical Commission has told us, that is the National Historic District. So that is the symbolic designation and not the really nitty gritty preservation restriction on that area. But they always use that uh, when uh, allowing businesses or people to do things in that area they use them that to uh, build buildings and things like that. So wouldn't that be the same thing? So it, as from what I understand from when I brought this forward to the Massachusetts Historical Commission, it does not carry the same amount of weight. So this would create specifically a commission within the town that if you wanted to alter your building, you wanted to uh, put different siding on it, you wanted to put an addition on, it would be a separate application that you would submit to that commission. 
And then there'd be a public hearing on it where you would present on uh, the changes you would like to make. And then based on the historical character of your building and the architectural features, it would then be decided uh, if it was believed to be within that those same features, if it would be approved or if it wouldn't be approved. So right now we don't have those specific, that specific bylaw on the books to have this uh, specific local historic district, uh, as well as that um, commission who would oversee that. Are you working with the planning board on this? So right now we are in the very early stages. So we wanted to come to the select board first as ultimately it's the select board who uh, votes to uh, formally form the study committee. And then it would be ultimately the select board who created, who wrote the letters that went out to the various organizations that the Massachusetts Historical Commission requires us to work with. We would also want to work with the planning board. As you mentioned, they would be invited to join the planning committee. And uh, because it's not just the historical commission that would be doing this, it would be uh, multiple groups coming together to uh, form that new study committee that would ultimately decide if this was something we wanted to completely pursue and follow through all the steps. We would also be working closely with the Massachusetts Historical Commission as they are the ultimate authority on creating okay. local so historic districts. This basically is just a study committee at this point to see about developing historic district in the center of town and having authority over it. Um, is that my understanding? Yes. So. Right now, that's what we want to create is the study committee, and then we would do the research, pull in any people who are interested, have concerns, and uh, go through the process from there to decide if this is ultimately how we want to go. And then, of course, as I mentioned, it has to pass two-thirds majority at a town meeting. Okay. I think CPA is involved in that because they do have some generalization over historic things that they you know, provide over. So we may want to include them on that also. Okay. All right. So further study. And certainly if this is a study committee uh, and more research is going to be done on that, then I can, you know, certainly think that would be a great thing to do. So could we Thank you. A, uh, motion to approve a historical district. Hang on, hang on, hang on. John? Listen, what we've been through with North Hadley Hall with restrictions and the Conservation Commission with the Historical River now, I just can't see this at this time. Absolutely not. Amy, you had your hand up. I just want to know why or why not Russell School would be included or not included in, in this. Well, the town hasn't decided what we're going to do with it. We've talked about it. We've uh, I don't think we've done our non-binding question on Russell School yet that we had discussed. Um, we put out an RFP, correct me if I'm wrong, Carolyn, and we had two responses and turns out neither of them were interested in doing some sort of lease arrangement and remodeling the building. So if we were to uh, put this in, a, include Russell School in a historic district, we would be, my understanding is, let's just say the town said, that's it, we're gonna take the building down. And if that's what the voters wanted to do, we most likely would not be able to do that. Is that correct? If it's in a historic district or we would have to run it through the historical mm -hmm. committee to do that? Yes, yeah, so you'd have to run it through the preservation commission and then it would be decided by them if it could be taken down or not, depending on, uh, what probably needed to be done to the building. Uh, and usually as we saw, um, I think you had to go through this with the Massachusetts Historical Commission in regards to Hooker School, um, some remediation and making sure that the building is properly documented. So we just have that information on file. So my, my concern with that is that we're, you know, the voters could be, you know, the vast majority could, and I'm, this is all theoretical, but the vast majority could all be in favor of taking down the building and it could come down to the members of the historical society or historical commission uh, overruling the voters and saying, no, you can't take the building down. So that, that's why I have concerns about that building being included until the voters have spoken as far as what the future of that building is. 
Is it too late to get that non-binding question on the warrant for this spring? I don't think it would be on the warrant. I think it would be on for a, an election question, right? And so I don't think we're, we don't have any uh, election needs for after this town. You're muted, Carol. I would, I would think this would be called a good idea, but it could ultimately cause a classic analysis paralysis. So I'm kind of hesitant on kind of doing anything about this at this point. I thought it was already a historic building. This reminds me of back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, Alec Coolis. Uh, with the Historic Commission um, applied for a portion of Hadley to be in the National Historic Register. Yeah. But then if I remember, well, I'm certain, I know I remember correctly. They never got a town meeting vote on it. So there mm -hmm. was always uh, some, some issues with whether or not people could change certain properties. I know I had an issue with it when um, with the house that we bought versus the house that we built, uh -huh. um, but there was never a vote on it. So uh, I think we need to be cautious here because uh, the restrictions are, are pretty substantial. I mean, it, it sounds and it, this reminds me of like a homeowners association or a condo association that can override what property owners can and can't do to their own properties, right? So you could it could be the color of your siding, the color of your door, the, the <laughs> which, which which they have in other towns. Right. Yeah, right. You, but I, yeah, I just want to make sure that's what we want in Hadley. That's all. I don't think so. M may I make a statement? Do you, Do you mind if I speak up here sure, a minute? Buddy. Yeah. So um, I used to have a house in Newport, Rhode Island. And after being on the finance committee for several years and seeing how Hadley is run and by whom, I decided to sell that property and I invested in Hadley. Now, one of the problems, I, you know, I, I am a person who, who really does love preserving historic buildings. I think it's an important aspect of what we do for the future generations of, of the town. I think it's, it's something that we need to do. However, what I discovered with my house in Newport was that um, all of this power was given to a group of a few people. And it was really, it was just like crazy, the kind of restrictions they made. For example, on my house, I wanted to replace the lattice work around my porch. And even though the lattice work that I was replacing was just regular, you know, store-bought lattice work, the, the four people or whatever it was, the four or five people on the <laughs> committee made me have that lattice handmade at multiple times the, the cost of, um, of just buying lattice. And it was just like, it, it was kind of infuriating because just a few people had all the power to, um, to, to really impact the well-being of properties in that area. And it just seemed like a, 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 a giveaway of, of people's, um, really their financial well-being. Can I just jump in here really quick? Um, so the, the historic district that's already in the center of town, that's the symbolic part, um, already kind of has some restrictions on it. And the historical commission has, you know, made decisions that are better for the town. Like almost every one of the town buildings has a metal roof instead of some historic slate roof or whatever, because it's practical. And I think the townspeople of Hadley and whoever is gonna be sitting on this board will continue to be practical people. And then the big thing that we're gaining with this is being a local historic certified local government which is going to get us grant funding for a lot of different buildings and public spaces in the town. Um, and I, since joining the historical commission two years ago, people always say, 
oh, like you let that grant go by or you let that grant go by, but we're not eligible for those grants because we are not, we don't have a local historic district. So we're missing out on money all the time for not just these buildings that we're talking about protecting, but all the public buildings in the town. Um, but there has to be time and place with historic preservation and it has to be balanced with evolution. Uh, towns need to be, needs to evolve and have balance. And, you know, I think those are some of the things that we have to, um, we have to look at, you know, uh, Hadley loses grants because we have financial stability. Um, this has always been uh, one of our problems in not being able to get any grants because we're sometimes they say we're a too rich community because we've been frugal with our money. And, you know, sometimes that just doesn't play out for us uh, when we go after the grants. And, you know, we like having that little savings account that we have, but we also have been penalized many, many times over the years for having that. All right, so what do we want to do with this? I don't know, I'd like to put it on hold for right now. Make a motion to put it on hold. Second. I second that. John beat you to it there, Amy, sorry. <laughs> you need faster Wi-Fi. Um, sorry. I'd like, I'd like to talk to some of the property owners in that area and see how they feel before we even go through with this. Yeah, me too. So just so we're clear about who the property owners are, it's basically the town, the church, the farm museum, and possibly the people who own the One Vodka and um, the person who owns the Dunkin' Donuts building, if we have to include the Dunkin' Donuts building. So it's a very small group of people. Um, it's all in a national historic uh, now. District. Yeah. Correct, it is included in the National Historic District. Until we know what Russell School, what's gonna happen with Russell School, and I know we've said that for probably a hundred years now, but uh, until the voters have spoken and made it clear to, to us what we're going to do with the building, I can't take that power away from the voters and hand it to a, a small group of people in town to be kind of the deciders uh, as far as what will happen with that building. So I, I, I can't support that. Motion on the table. All right, uh, Jennifer, roll call. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Tungalo? Yes. Ms. Gevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right, I do appreciate you guys making the effort to, to bring it forward. It's just, uh, obviously we've got some concerns that we need to work out. So you know, let's keep talking and maybe we can work out those concerns and uh, come up with another option. So. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you guys. Uh, Patrick, are you here? I am here. Can you hear me now? Yep, I, we can hear you now. Great. Um, thank God. Oh. Sorry about that. <laughs> so uh, give us an update on the library. Uh, Tommy started up updating us and saying you guys were working together on the punch list, but, but what do you have? Yeah, so um, all of the items that were brought to uh, to the attention of that large group of people that were emailed, all of those are either um, in the process of being addressed uh, or, I mean, pretty much everything on there is being addressed. There, we have a quote for the gutter, uh, we're waiting for materials for that, for that to be installed. Uh, the one-way signs have been ordered by DPW. Those are gonna be paid for out of the project budget. And uh, the issues with the lawn have been brought to the attention of the contractor. I'm hoping to meet with uh, Scott McCarthy, if, if not tomorrow, sometime this week, to look at the state of the loam, what has been put down and what needs to be there. The spec shows six inches. So if there's not six inches, we're gonna have them come back and put more down until there's six inches and make sure that it's properly seated. So as far as I can tell, everything that has been brought to my attention is in process and is being addressed. Tommy, are you anything that he, uh, Patrick is missing uh, on that list? Nope, uh, he had actually sent uh, forwarded from Mark Sullivan, and it, it even says right in the um, execution of the lawn construction that finished graves with it's got to be six or more inches um, and will be accomplished basically without additional cost to the contract. So um, we can go out with Scott and, uh, you know, do some test spots and see and, and 
you know, some spots there is just gravel, you know, there. So they'll have to have to warranty that. Okay. Anybody else have any uh, concerns for Patrick on the, the library construction? Yeah, uh, Patrick, I emailed you back a couple different uh, email addresses, but I'm going to try to uh, catch up with you before the end of the week and speak to you because I'm your liaison now. Very good. Yeah, just get in touch. We'll we'll meet. I'd, I'd be happy to meet you at the library and show you around. Okay, sounds good. All right. Well, thank you, Patrick. Sorry to make you wait, uh, I, you know, to get back on the phone there. So uh, Not thank a problem. Not thanks for stopping by. All right. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything else in the library? Did someone have something else? No. Okay. Uh, let's keep going. I think the uh, Hadley Climate Change Committee. I think Jack might be Hi. here. For that. I'm here. I'm here, David. Uh, sorry to make you wait so long. <laughs> well, that's all right. Hey. Um, so, I am curious as to who our new liaison is. Have you folks established that? think we have so i'm on the um recycle and i might as well just take on climate change from that level all right jane looking forward to working with you so an idea that's come up in um a recent meeting of the hadley climate change committee and it was by inspired by people in the town of leverett is to put forward a spring cleanup day for our community uh, to the best of our knowledge, there are no other groups doing anything like that. Uh, I don't know if any of the select board members know of anybody doing a cleanup day. We understand that the Mother's Day have the uh, the Mother's Club have the recycling day, but this is a little different. Uh, am I able to share my screen? Yes. Thank you. So I hope you can all see this now. Yeah, it's not fitting. Make it smaller or center it. Uh, let's see. No, it fits. It fits. Don't change it. Okay. So on May 15th, that's the same day that the Hadley Mothers Club is doing their recycling day. We are hoping to recruit volunteers to clean up our streets from 8 a.m. to noon. Uh, the, uh, Patrick Kennedy from Solid Waste Solutions said that the transfer station would be willing to accept um, people dropping off uh, trash that we pick up on the side of the street. No large items, you know, just um, cans, trash, things like that. So with no extra cost, with no extra need for people to buy transfer station stickers, they would do that. Home Depot was willing to have us meet there at their parking lot and they would provide some trash bags for us. One of the trashiest um, lots in town is the little lot across from Home Depot. So we would try to clean up along the road. Taking a look at the second page and once it's approved by you all, this is something that I can send to Jennifer and to Carolyn so you'll have a sense of what we're doing. So we would invite people to choose an area, probably around their neighborhood or nearby, recruit friends, family, uh, would have a sign-up sheet and people would pick up trash at morning, separate out the recyclables and roughly estimate what they're picking up so we can keep track a little bit, but this isn't just a data gathering thing. This is just really in, to clean up our town. People can take photos. We are adding a page for the climate change committee on the town website. So that's something that we could post there. And again, as I said earlier, there'd be free trash disposal for people who are pre-registered. Uh, we would use COVID protocols, whatever they might look like in another half month. We encourage people to stay off major roads, especially Route 9, wear bright colors, stay six feet apart, all of that. Um, so what are some of your first impressions and what are some of the other considerations that we should take into account in making this public and setting it up for a few weeks from now? Looks great. I mean, does the, do Hopkins students still need volunteer hours or volunteer 
I guess okay. probably go. David. Yeah, community service projects. I think they always do. I think if the seniors don't, the juniors would. And I have been in contact with Annie McKinsey, who said once we have this all organized, she would put it out through her weekly email to parents. Uh, you know, we are hoping to get some co-sponsors, uh, whether it's the Young Men's Club, um, you know, the Friends of the Hadley Library, the Friends of Hadley Schools, it, just to make this a thing. And we are hoping that this could be something that's an annual event where we take some time um, and clean up our community. We are wondering if we could put it out on the town messaging system like what the limits are, if we have something organized, is that a way that we could spread the word? Yeah, we have a, um, Jennifer has a, a list for the email blast that goes out to everyone that's subscribed for events like this. I think that'd be reasonable to do. Good. It, Jennifer, would that include texting or would that be the email blast? Um, I can do texting as well. Um, we, we do try to save the texting for, um, road closures, emergency things. Sure. But we could, we could with select board approval do that. But otherwise I could do an email blast from the website and a Nixel. I could email both lists. All right. So you and I can work together over the next few days to get that organized. So it can go out about 10 days ahead of time. Um, are there some things that I need to do, like um, checking in with Chief Mason about safety concerns, anything like that? If you probably run it by police and fire, you may have some more help volunteers down the road too, you know. I know it's your first annual, but once yeah. it's organized and we do this every year, I think it'll work out pretty well. Yeah, and we hope that it's a plus to do it on the same day that the Mothers Club is doing their recycling day. That's why we picked it. Uh, we have the next day as the rain date. Not necessarily, because I helped the Mothers Club, and I wouldn't mind helping you. Well, another year we might look at that or maybe shift yeah. the time. Are you mostly doing your pickup at Hadley Elementary in the morning, John? Uh, no, they're, they're just doing a drop-off. We don't want to go into folks' houses. Okay. Uh, sure we, we stopped last year, took yeah. a break last year, but uh, they want the cleanup day to get some revenue in for the schools. Of so, course. Is, um, what are the hours of the cleanup day? Is it the whole day or just the morning? No, uh, it's, it's eight to one. Uh, mm, okay. I think that's online also, and that's also on the Mother's Club uh, Facebook page, I believe. All right, so this year maybe the hours conflict a little bit, but we'll get this figured out. All right, yeah, we can work on it. Get a hold of Mrs. Devine or uh, Mrs. Pliska and we can uh, figure it out. Yeah, and one thing I want to repeat is Patrick Kennedy did say that he doesn't want to open this up, you know, for everybody to have a free dump day. It, he's really expecting a list where they can check it off and make sure that people who pre-registered for this event can come in and just drop off the trash they accumulate so they're not having to find other ways to dispose yeah. of it. Yeah, have some accountability for the people that are picking up so then you can give it to him. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other suggestions on things that I need to do in the next few days before um, moving this through the Climate Change Committee and getting it publicized? No, I think we just we need I was going to say that, oh, sorry. <laughs> No, you're good. Go ahead. Um, I was, <laughs> I was gonna say that you could really look into, um, you know, Girl Scout clubs, um, 4-H clubs, um, Boy Scout clubs, any of those type of clubs um, as well. If you were looking for um, more people to be involved, yeah, that's a great idea. I know some of those uh, groups have kind of folded. I don't know where things stand with Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts these days. I think there's still a Girl Scouts group. Um, we will put it out on um, Facebook page and all that. So again, the next steps, Jennifer, I'll organize the write-up. I'll send it to you. I'll send it to Annie McKenzie. And Jane, of course, you'll be CC'd. I'll send it out to the rest of the committee and all the members on the committee will spread the word. We were going to use the Next Door Neighbor app if that's cool with you, to advertise a town event. Uh, Chief Spankman will have a question. Oh, yeah. 
Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to offer up if you want to get it to us, well, are you okay with us using your flyer? We'll get it on our, our Facebook pages and then also, Absolutely. The um, more the merrier. Um, Claire and I, we're going to be taking on Mount Warner. We've been doing a little pre-cleaning just to make it a little easier uh, that day. We're going to start across the street from Home Depot. Um, and, you know, we're hoping other people step up and some of the businesses too, maybe clean up around their locations. Are you tracking volunteers? Are you going to be tracking the volunteers? Do you need resources? We do have some, you know, uh, we have some gloves that we could provide that aren't medical grade. And we do have yeah. some, uh, reflective vests that we could loan out that we use. Yeah, that, that's a good thing. Uh, what they did in Leverett is they actually had people sign up via an app and really track the trash closely. This year, I don't think we're in the spot where we can do this. Um, but what I'll do in, again, Jennifer or um, Carolyn, if we have an overall spreadsheet, like a Google, Google Sheets list of town streets, that would be um, easy for me to organize. We yeah. actually have a good sheet for you if you want uh, that we use for driver training, if you'd like. Yeah, that, that would be good. Mike, what's the best way for me to email you? Just send it to the uh, the, uh, the Spank Nable M at HadleyMA.org. Okay, I think um, I have. And Jack, you're going to email Chief Mason as well. Yeah, so. absolutely. I didn't. I thought I saw him here earlier. He he was. It might have just gotten a little long in the evening. Um, yeah. So, but he, uh, when you call me, we'll I'll get you his email address and we'll get you connected with him. Excellent, excellent. All right, thank you, everybody. Can Appreciate I a uh, motion to approve the event from the select board, please. I move. I move. Okay, Jane, uh, second, someone? I'll second, second that. All right, I'll give that one to Amy. That was a tie, but. <laughs> My internet sucks and I am sorry. <laughs> All right, motion by Jane, second by Amy, and uh, roll call vote, Jennifer, please. Roll call vote, uh, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Miskevitz? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Thank Have you. a good night. Thank you. You also. Thank you. Uh, before I move on, I forgot we need two things. Um, we need a liaison to the Housing and Economic Development um, Committee. Uh, Christian was was on there, and I don't remember if we talked about that or not. Uh, Molly was was asking about that if if he was going to continue. And uh, I sent them an email, but I didn't get a response. So um, would somebody else like to take that from the select board or we do, do we want to keep Christian on that? If he'd like to keep it, he can. Okay. And if, if no one else wants that one, then I will. The yeah, I thought there was a couple that he wanted to keep and, and keep up with. All right, so I'll, I'll try reaching out to him again and ask him if he wants to keep the housing and then um, the diversity committee. Uh, Jane, were you wanting to be on the diversity committee, you said? I'm or? interested in that one. Say that again? Yes. Yes, you want to be on that one? Okay. All right. I nominate, well, somebody nominate Jane to be our liaison for diversity. So moved. All right. Second. All right. Second by John. I think Amy's frozen over there in the corner. Yep. All right. Amy, when you get back on, turn your camera off and you'll have better internet connection. All right, Jennifer. Yeah. Roll call vote. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Nevin Smith? Yes. Tungalo? Yes. Ms. Kevitz? John? Yes. Parsons? Yes. All right, sounds good. All right, I think that's all the leftovers from the committees that I had to uh, hit. Um, all right, let's go to uh, DPW emergency water projects, 6.1 on the agenda. And is Chris here? Yep, Chris is here. Chris, do you wanna talk about what, what you're proposing or what you need to do? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for allowing me to make my case before the board. We have, um, three events that we like the board to, we're bringing before the board. Um, two of them have to do with water division. 
the two water storage tanks, one Mount, Mount Holyoke and one Mount Warner. I will begin with Mount Holyoke. Mount Holyoke, we have a, a roughly $80,000 job to get done. It's an emergency. The electrical power is failing. And from Lawrence Plain to where the tank is, we also have to go through, we have an easement, we have to go through um, people's uh, driveway and uh, also um, long, narrow way to get to where the tank is. And so we need to put a new trench, bring the code, uh, the electrical uh, new boxes up to code and put the uh, sleeves. The current power that we have to Mount Holyoke, because of the time it was done, uh, has lasted, but it was the wires were put on into the earth. There was no casing, there was no sleeve. So time has impacted on it due to erosions and water and different things. So one of the power line has failed. So we are basically on the on, um, emergency phase. We cannot guarantee when the other wire would fail. And that's why we're asking that uh, we cannot, we need the authorization to get it going. Uh, our electrical contractor has given us a quote. And also, we also got uh, three quotes for the general contractor who were doing the, um, the roads and the trench. Um, Scott McCarthy and I, we also met with the homeowners in the area where we have an easement telling them what we want to do. And they also will be fixing their driveway because we have to go through the driveway. Um, so for the past couple of, uh, about a month or two now, uh, the town administrator and I have been discussing this. We've also gone before the finance committee to update them on this matter. So at this point, uh, that is Mount Holyoke. So uh, no, I'm sorry. Before we move on, are you asking us for a specific approval to do the repair or what, what, are, what do you need from the select board or is this just informational for today? I will leave that to Caroline. I don't know if you need any particular thing with the select, but I'll assume it's just FYI. Yeah, these, these are, because they're emergencies, I felt it was important that the select board know about it. And it will, uh, we will, we did get permission. Uh, we, we sent notification to DOR to let them know that this would be emergency funding because we don't have funding for it this year, we'll have to deficit spend uh, and we needed to do that. But these are three projects that um, I, in my judgment and Chris's judgment are uh, critical safety issues and um, we will be addressing it. It will be on the, the warrant uh, for funding and there's still a lot of moving parts to it. So I don't have the definite uh, 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 information about the whether we're borrowing or how we're borrowing or the anticipated funds that we'll be getting from ARPA. So I this was more I felt it was important that you guys understood what was going on the warrant for these projects. But but no votes or tonight or anything. This is just information. No. No. Okay. Good. All right. Sorry to interrupt, Chris. Keep going yeah, with the, uh, the the second one is Mawana storage water storage tank. Mawana is not an electrical issue. It has to is dealing with trees. Uh, we have an easement from the from Mawana to where we have the storage tank, but for some reason, uh, tree uh, we don't know why, how it is allowed, but we have trees, and uh, they've all grown big trees on on the easement, and so and also basically the tree roots are interfering with the with the main uh, pipe. Um, either bringing water to the tank or taking water to, to, the, to the town. And these are aged old tanks. So we, it's an emergency to be able, we want to take out those trees and maintain the easement so that in case of an emergency, we have an access to the tank. Right now, we don't have an access in to the tank in the case of an emergency. So that's where the, the urgency for that marijuana is. The third one is uh, the nightly road covert. We have uh, a nightly road, we have a covert where the head wall collapsed over a year ago, and I've been trying to get an approval from conservation. But uh, 
on the 13th of this month, they finally gave us a hearing and uh, they approved that we should fix it, but with various conditions. And uh, most of the conditions would cost money. Uh, so we are still waiting for them to give us a written format of the condition, but they approved that we should go ahead. Uh, the head wall has, because it's been exposed to elements, snow, rain, uh, it, it's, we, it, becomes, it became an emergency because we don't want the covert to collapse. Uh, the, so we are uh, at an urgency of time to get the hair wall fixed. And so that's where we, that's why we, those are the three items we just want to bring to the board as a FYI. Okay. Can we get some clarification on those requirements from CONCOM? Because they seemed a little over the top as far as, uh, from what I saw in the meeting of all kinds of additional meetings and, and taking things out of the professional engineer's hands and putting them into CONCOM's hands instead. So. I, Mr. Chairman, I, I agree. I, um, I, I don't know why they was, uh, my view, why they played a, for lack of a better word, a very hard, um, they were playing too much hardball with the, the town because everything they, they make comment on equates to dollars. And from the public works perspective and from this, our engineers, uh, it's a small job that could have been done less than the conditions they put in. So I've written a letter back to conservation asking them that I'm still with, it's two weeks now, we haven't gotten anything in writing yet, so. Okay. And, and, and I did speak with Janice about, especially the pre-construction meeting that's typically for a much bigger project. Yes. Um, and that we didn't wanna to have to pay for the engineers to come out to be a part of that. Yes. Uh, again, it wasn't in writing, but she assured me that that, may, that probably could be done right before they start construction and the engineers wouldn't have to be there, but. Good. Chris is right. We, we probably need to see something very specific in writing. It just seems like continuous overreach on that aspect, but okay. Exactly. Um, anybody else have anything for Chris on these projects? Yeah, I, I just got one comment uh, to back up the director there. Uh, we've had numerous uh, sewer pump stations along with this water station. Uh, many years ago, these were all direct berries when the power company came through and they don't even know, they can locate it pretty close, but they fix one break and then they're two feet away, six months later fixing another break. So if they put the conduit through, at least they, the conduit's in the ground and they can pull the wire a little bit easier if there's a problem with it in the future. So it, it's, it's a big investment, but it was never done originally. So this is where we're at with them. We, we just, we did Applebee's that way too, the pump station there. That was a direct berry. And yes, I remember. They had, right. had probably 10 uh, splices in there. And finally it was like, just replace it already. We've had nothing but trouble with them. Carolyn, are you envisioning that a lot of this money will come from the, uh, the water um, enterprise fund for the, for the water tank projects. Is that what you're thinking rather than borrowing or what do you? So, you know, I don't know if Linda's still on, we, we've thrown out a lot of, not thrown out, but we've considered a lot of different options. Um, I am still confident uh, regarding the ARPA money that, uh, that money is going to be available for that. They've actually, some of the language that they're using is targeting water projects but there would be, might have to be a temporary, Linda, correct me if I'm wrong, temporary borrowing in the meantime. Right, to be paid out of, back out of water reserves. There might be enough in reserves for these smaller projects. So um, I think the water reserves might be able to cover it without borrowing. If, especially if there's any money left over in your budget, if you know, if you have, if you were able to put something from budget. So we, we were actually talking about maybe putting some various pieces together reserve fund water yeah well, not item, reserve fund line item transfers or whatever yeah except it is enterprise so you want to stay w within the um within the right funding yeah exactly or, I, I think i think depending on did we decide all three of them were one of them wasn't necessarily a water one is that right carolyn the culvert is not uh, no, the culvert yeah, is not right yeah 
So, yeah, so between them, we thought we were to see what we could patch together. And then- So that we could avoid fun, uh, borrowing. For the culvert, Chris, can we use some of that MS4 money for that? Is that a possibility? Oh, interesting. No, we'll not, we'll not be able to use the MS4 because it's had war. If yeah. the culvert had collapsed, uh, yeah, then we could use the MS4 in, in, in part because of the waterway. But so because okay. it just had war, MS4 will not, uh, will not be able to use that funding. So I should go give it a push is what you're saying? <laughs> Yeah, once it falls in the water, then it's in the waterway. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. right. Any anything else for Chris on this? All right. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Carolyn, while you're on the go here, do you want to do your administrator report? Yeah, I'm going to consolidate it because I know we are way behind tonight. Um, but I do. If I can just also talk about COVID and reopening. Um, I think you've seen that the gov Governor ba Baker's announcement has uh, loosened uh, some of the restrictions on the number of people in a uh, gathering indoors over 200 after May 29th or effective May 29th. And then effective May 10th, large venues per are per permitted to increase capacity to 25%. Um, I, I have not gotten a recent update to see how Hadley is as far as numbers are concerned. Um, so I guess that might be good news, but I, I'm can't tell you what I know exactly what that is. We, I can touch base with Dr. Mosler. Uh, the, re, the report I am gonna consolidate, but I did wanna let you know we did get two bids for North Hadley Village Hall today, um, and we'll be reviewing those and then bringing those to the board next week. Uh, there's just a reminder on some dates, the Rabies Clinic is May 1st at the North Hadley Fire Substation parking lot. The fourth quarter real estate bills are due Monday, May 3rd, and the Mother's Club is holding recycling day um, on May, 5th, May 15th. Did I get them all, Jennifer? All right, that's it. There's more, but it's not, you need to keep going in your meeting. Okay, uh, let's see, we have- Hey, uh, Carolyn. Uh, uh, I, got a, I got a question. Uh, has anybody contacted UMass or do they plan on opening up the football season in the stadium uh, in the future? Or what's going on with that? So Nancy Barone has been pretty good about updating us um, about the status of UMass. I don't think the recent one addressed that, but I can reach out to Nancy if you'd like me to, John, find out. Is that specifically the well, stadium? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a big... Uh, venue so well the 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 teams have been playing john uh right. they start they started back playing so uh when we're talking with my docs that are uh they're they're the physicians for the sports teams uh they're anticipating that you know they're going to have but students have to now be vaccinated before they come back on campus in the fall so uh that's what they're looking for and everybody's got to follow suit so Everybody does what they do. We're, we're going to start to be back looking at full swing there. All right. So, uh, can, I, can I touch in on the COVID thing? Sure. I talked to Dean Baxter today about the Memorial Day Parade because that's now going to be allowed. And she says it's too late to... Um, do any long-term planning for a parade, but they would still have a service at the Cannon and they would also go to the cemeteries. And the select board is invited to join those. I talked to Richard Bukowski today um, and he also has informed me that there's some, um, something was said to the Legion that there's not the availability of a town bus um, Dennis Pachinski has offered to drive the bus. Um, so I'm not sure where we are with loaning a bus to the veterans so that they can go from cemetery to cemetery. Uh, if we as select board want to go in their own vehicles and go to the cemeteries, to the cemeteries, we could, depending on how many veterans will actually, uh, be getting on the bus that we would have to do. They've also been, um, uh, Grip Co's in South Deerfield has offered a bus to them also. So 
uh, they still would like to be able to go to each cemetery, but they're looking for a bus. They have a driver. Uh, they were told there was no money in the school budget for them to take a school bus. So I, I don't know where we are with that, that we couldn't, um, you know, if Dennis wants to volunteer his time and we want to volunteer a school bus, uh, it might not be a bad thing for us to do. If we could think about that, please, next week for our next meeting. Why don't we vote on it tonight if someone wants to make a motion? And I would, uh, I would volunteer to fill it up with a diesel at the end of the day, whatever was used for the, the purposes of busing people around. So if we want to give them the bus, I'll pay for the gas. It's fine. All right. Sure. Thank you, David. I'll make a motion to accept that. A second. All right. Any other discussion on that? Can we ask? Can we ask Dennis if he's going to volunteer his time and he's not going to get paid? Oh, you you already volunteered him. <laughs> now you're going to break him the good news. Uh, <laughs> I'll the fuel with you, David. All right, and Mr. I, Chairman. Yeah, I just ask a question on that because. Um, I've been getting like weekly emails from the town of Hatfield. It sounds like they had worked a, um, an a arrangement with the Legion because um, they're doing their 350th parade on that Sunday. Will that yes, yes, yes. What, is what you're talking about on Sunday or will it be on they Monday? What'd you say, Jennifer? I... Jennifer, what'd you say? I Sorry, spoke and you did and I shouldn't have. <laughs> Uh, um, from, from an HR uh, perspective, just you got to make sure it's it's clear from a volunteer standpoint. It's the only thing oh, I have yeah. to add. Yeah, yeah. No, Dennis has been good about volunteering to drive in the past, off off the clock, no, nothing related to the town. So um, I don't know what they were the talking board. about, but they know about the Hadley, the Hatfield event. Well, let's get a let's get an affirmative date on that with them. Um, because I think, are we all participating in the Hatfield, uh, Mike Spankenable, our, our, uh, our chiefy, are we going to go to Hatfield with our fire or what, what are we doing with that department? Well, they've, they've sent out the, um, the agreement that you have to sign off on. And I believe yeah. that was sent to you guys. I don't, uh, certainly we'll try, we're going to try and send a truck, but if we're, I just want to make sure that we're not spreading ourselves too thin because we normally support our, you know, we always do our color guard for the Legion. So yeah. it sounded like from what I was told is they might be doing it on Monday. That's why I was just asking if you had heard anything because we would that like was to at our, to Hatfield. Yeah, that's what was said at our last meeting that if Hatfield was having it on Sunday, then uh, our Legion would do it on Monday. So let's confirm that. Um, and then see what we can go from there. I think it also depended on the weather too, Joyce. So yeah, yeah, always has, right? I've been out at many cemeteries from the time I was on school committee until now, carrying an umbrella, going to the cemetery. So we always did that, no matter what. So I know we got wet a couple times. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Can I ask for clarification? Who said what? I said you're still here after getting wet, which is the good news. Jennifer, you were asking for a clarification on something? On the motion. Okay. We're voting on giving a school bus to the BFW uh, or a, don't the American Legion, excuse me. Yeah, we, we were going to allow them to use a town school bus like we've done in the past for the event. And I said I would uh, reimburse the town for the, any of the cost of the fuel that's used for it by via donation. And uh, if we, we have approval on a school committee, yeah. And then we have Dennis, I think, to who has volunteered in the past to drive buses, but we'll confirm that with him that he's able to do that. So, so basically, it should all be at no cost to the town since we don't have the money to to pay for it. Thank you. I'll contribute also. That's fine. And that, that was a motion by Joyce. And who was it second by? Jane. Jane. Okay. Just want to make sure we got it for the minutes. All right. Roll call. Roll call vote, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungaloo. Yes. Ms. Gevitz. Yes. Parsons. Yes. Thank you. 
All right, so the last thing I have before executive session is annual report dedication for 7.3. And uh, for the 2020 annual report, we and Fred Oakley Award. Dedication nominees are for the report, David Nixon, Martha Boisvert, Janine Giles, Molly Keegan, and emergency management. I guess that's all of emergency management personnel. Fred Oakley Award, uh, Sloan Spanknable, Gage Spanknable, uh, Janine Giles, and Molly Keegan. I'll make a motion for a dedication of the town book to David Nixon. And I'd also like um, to make a motion to dedicate the book also, which we've done in the past to, in memory of um, Martha Boysford and Janine Giles. Um, they certainly have, um, in Janine and Martha's case, they, they, they and their businesses have always stepped up to uh, town and um, donated many of their services and uh, were very generous in their donations to many functions that occurred during town. David, of course, has, uh, I know we employed him for the last 15 years, but uh, the amount of time and effort and meetings and things that he attended over the years for the last, last 15 years, um, I don't think any other town has had a town administrator for 15 years. So um, I think we kind of lucked out in many different ways. Uh, we had many uh, mountains and valleys and uh, things that we uh, had with David. And I think he certainly is deserving of our uh, town book this year. I'll second that. Okay. Motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any other discussion on the dedications? Well, it was kind of just for town folks. So I'm kind of a little hesitant with David, but I understand what you're talking about, Joyce. But uh, two women with the two businesses have done much more for a lot more years than David has. So. Well, um, since they're, in, unfortunately, since it's in memorial to them, um, and very sad at our, you know, that we have to talk about their passing and their people can't be honored when they're alive. And, all of a sudden when they pass, we honor them for their dedication. But, you know, David's alive and he did put more uh, into the town. And we have done other town employees, um, even though they have been uh, town employees and they've lived in town. But um, I think he is deserving of this for this year. I think it would be uh, a nice gesture. We didn't have any party for him or anything else at this point. And I just think it would be something special that we also recognize people that work for our town that do dedicate their lives for us over the last 15 years. I think that's important. Yeah. Oh, and we've never done current employees. I don't believe in the past for, to avoid issues, but no. since David, a former employee um, and you know so, so much that he did for the town I think it would be appropriate in this case and we're still avoiding the possible conflict of you know dedicating to current employees so I'm, I'm okay with that but anyways um, any other comments Jennifer we're called out Phil yes Nevin Smith Chungalo yes Kevitz Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you. All right. All right. So last we have, we had posted for an executive. Oh, session. wait a minute, David. We didn't do the Fred Oakley award. Fred Oakley one now. So I'd like oh. to make that dedication to Sloan and Gage uh, Spank and Abel. Um, as young citizens of Hadley, um, they have dedicated their time. Gage has uh, dedicated time to the fire department. Sloan and Cage have both been uh, at our uh, any function that's been available, uh, doing their time, registering people, uh, cleaning everything from um, town uh, polls um, when we've had elections and um, certainly have put themselves out there as young uh, citizens of Hadley, and I'd like to have dedicate the uh, Fred Oakley Award to them. 
I will say that the person who did it, who nominated them, specifically spoke to what they've done over the last year for COVID, the mm-hmm. grocery shopping, um, the food deliveries, and and Susan's uh-huh. nodding. And yeah. She was the one who dedicated it, who nominated them, but that was specifically what the person was speaking to is what they've done over the last, the course of the last year, in addition to everything that Joyce just said. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion and a second. I have a motion, I don't have a second. I need a second. Uh, Jane said second, but she's muted, so yep, she's nodding, okay. There, yes. All right, all right. so Jennifer, roll call. No. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Kangaloo. Yes. Skevitz. Yes, and we need about 20 more of their friends also to donate. <laughs> I want to know they don't get nominated. They don't get the award unless they get more friends to volunteer and Parsons. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right. Any quick announcements before we move to executive session? I have one. Um, unfortunately, I have uh, uh, expressing condolences to Michael DeCola on the passing of his wife, Bonnie. Um, we do send out our condolences to him and his children for her passing. Okay. Anybody else? I, I did forget to mention it, but I have uh, May 5th as our next meeting. I'm not sure if we, uh, we talked about these. We'll talk about the rest of this, the year uh, next meeting, but I have May 5th, May 19th for a meeting, which is also the public forum for the yes, Jennifer. I thought you wanted to do the 12th as the form to give people more time. Um, okay, we can do that. Let's just let's just talk about May 5th then for tonight. We'll figure that other one out. <laughs> so May 5th, our next meeting. Is that okay with everybody on the board? Yes. Yeah. Right, we'll figure out the schedule for the rest of the year. Um, all right. So we had posted for an executive session regarding park and rec. We are not going to hold that executive session, but we do have a um, emergency executive session regarding North Hadley Village Hall. So I'll read this. The select board will enter into emergency executive session pursuant to MGL chapter 30A section 21A3 to discuss litigation regarding the matter of uh, Hieronymus Peter versus, or Peter Hieronymus uh, versus town of Hadley where discussion in open session would have a detrimental effect on the town's litigation position and the, cho- the chair so declares. So if I could get Still a motion to Joyce, Still motion by Joyce. Yeah, second. second. Second by John. As the chair of the Hadley Select Board, I state that the board has moved and seconded to enter into executive session. And I state that discussing the matter in open session will have an adverse effect on the town of Hadley and we will not reconvene in open session. Uh, roll call vote. Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Kevitz? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Thank you.